Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the short lunch break. Um, it is the committee's goal to finish up on issue paper number six and begin issue begin and finish issue paper number seven, which is on the 9010 rule, uh, prior to going into our public comment period today, beginning at 4 p.m. Uh, so with that, Greg, I'm happy to turn it back over to you and the committee, but I do just want to ask everyone, all the negotiators, um, who I want to thank for all their thoughtful comments throughout this week. Um, if, if you're able to, in this, this finishing up with issue paper six, to keep comments um, general in nature and on serious concerns that you have that you want to raise for the department, um, because as always, the expectation is the department will um, take back all your suggestions that you've been emailing and putting in the chat um, prior to week number two. So, so the, the goal here is to move somewhat expeditiously into issue paper number seven. Um, so with that, Brad, I see your hand, but Greg, anything you want to kick us off with? Uh, we were, when we left off, uh, uh, involved in a discussion about the uh, elements in um, in E, I believe, is where we left off. And we had a, a couple of comments related to that. And that, just to remind everybody, that's uh, if the institution is provisionally certified, the secretary may apply such conditions as are determined to be appropriate to the institution, including, and there was, we went over a list in, um, some discussions there again reiterating that that list is not a, an exhaustive list and um so i'll continue the discussion great uh so brad i see your hand you're you're welcome to start but i just want to welcome back in uh, to the table on behalf of uh to your public institutions community so brad please go ahead oh, we, we can't hear you right now brad thank you thank you um so so real quick, section 32E, paragraph one, risk of closure. The comment is that an institution at risk of closure may need the ability to make necessary changes to ensure it does not close, which might include new or revised programs or arrangements with other institutions. So how is the department going to determine that an institution is at a risk of closure? The proposal that the department is that they would have the authority to place a wide range of restrictions on the institution at the risk of closure, but that concept is wide open. I think we need a lot more detail regarding how that decision would be made and what metrics and criteria would be used to be comfortable with the list of the proposed restriction. Um, thank you. Uh, we'll take that back. I, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, certainly where we're putting, where we have placed an institution on. Uh, on provisional certification, we, we, we do have uh, cause to believe that there are um, problems with the institution that we need to uh, to be aware of. And, and again, um, we have a specific uh, concern about uh, precipitous closure because of uh, how that affects, and, and I think how it has affected uh, students um, in, in the past. So we, we do take special uh, uh, care to, to uh, to consider that possibility, but we'll, we'll take back your consideration. If you have language you'd like us to consider, uh, let us know. Thank you. We also care about those students. We just want to make sure we understand the criteria. Uh, On number eight, um, the department here is proposing to require pre clearance of marketing materials if the institution has been alleged to have engaged in a misrepresentation and the school is on a provisional PPA. Let me remind you that a school is automatically on a provisional PPA when a change of control occurs. So what if one student makes a claim and that claim is unwarranted? Basic due process demands that the department give institutions time to respond to allegations. I don't see anything like this built into the proposal. And then on timing, I think all institutions that are subject to this requirement would fear that after they send marketing materials to the department to be reviewed, it will go into a black hole and they wouldn't hear back for months. For example, on Tuesday, we were talking about how several states had submitted applications for the ATB to the department, those applications were automatically approved because the department couldn't process them within six months. My question is, is the department really gonna hire additional staff to conduct reviews of these marketing materials, all these equity disbursements and lawsuits we discussed yesterday? To be crystal clear, the department needs a process in place to, to ensure timely review of those materials. The largest school in the country is a nonprofit in the Northeast. It spends $144 million a year in marketing, yet I don't believe anyone in the department is reviewing their marketing materials. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Ernest, please. 
Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to focus in on um, part one, Romanet three here around holds on student transcripts um, over a de minimis amount. I presume prior, obviously, to a school's closure and the secretary secretary's authority here. Um, and I'd like to consider recommending that the department kind of cross out the amount about over a de minimis amount or a particular amount and just consider releasing holds on transcripts once the secretary deems that a school may be at risk of closure at all under any circumstances here. Um, you know, thinking from a student perspective, if I was at an institution that I had awareness was even being considered um, as a risk for closure, I would want to transfer. Um, as I know the department knows, um, you know, it's kind of highlighted by announcements made uh, by Secretary Cordona, as well as the CFPB this week. Um, transcript holds uh, for certain amounts uh, have kind of a precipitous effect on a student's ability uh, who may owe money to an institution to transfer to another institution. Um, so I think this is particularly the case for students from uh, historically disadvantaged and kind of unconsidered backgrounds, particularly black Latina students. Um, and to the extent that it uh, makes sense or there's no uh, kind of specific um, line of thought for kind of this consideration of over a certain amount uh, prior to closure, uh, I guess that would just be, it'd be my recommendation that um, the department considers releasing holds altogether once the school is kind of in that category of uh, being at risk for closure. Thank you. Uh, Yael, please. To Ernest's point, just from the experience of an enforcement body, I want to just provide the context that it has been, even for state AGs, an unbelievably difficult and an often in, in many times fruitless effort to get transcripts for students after schools close. Um, so I agree. I think the department should prioritize ensuring that students have, have access to their transcripts and that they're not held hostage by these institutions. Um, beyond that, I'm glad to see that there's language here about record retention policies, but in the same vein, I want to note that we have had an unbelievably difficult time getting records from schools after the schools have closed and in some instances in the lead up to school closures. And that has a cascading effect for, uh, for borrowers. Not only does it affect their ability to uh, continue their education in different contexts, but borrowers who may be entitled to relief of different types are just unable to get it because they can't because they they just they don't have what they need to do it. Um, so I would suggest, and I'll think if there's language to be proposed here, but that we consider uh, strengthening the record retention language to be a little clearer about what's expected um, from the schools in those. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Uh, Debbie, I see your hand. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I agree with all of Yael's comments, and I think um, I, I would also suggest for both Romanet one and two. Um, you know, the, the Romanet 1 uh, asks institutions to submit the agreement to the institution's recognized accrediting agency. I would ask that state authorizing agencies also be added to that. Um, and I think that the same reporting requirements should apply for Romanet 2 as well with respect to the records retention plan. Um, again, states and accrediting agencies may be closer to the ground, maybe the first line of defense is student questions. Um, and um, having been in a loop on those would be incredibly helpful and important. Um, secondarily, is there a definition of records retention plan and what exactly would be included in there? I'm, I'm happy to submit some language for consideration, but um, but didn't want to start from scratch if you already have something. Uh, we do have a section on records retention, but I don't believe we have any uh, definition of records retention plan. So if you're suggesting that we define records retention plan, um, you can submit language to that effect. Um, would you be able to point me to the records retention just so I can, I will, I'm happy again to draft something, but that would be a good starting place. Maybe it's okay if he, if he takes a second to Absolutely. set up. Absolutely. I think right. it's just, I, th I think to make sure we're helping students, it's important we get certain pieces of information. Gotcha. You can yeah. move on to the next comment. No, I'll, I'll, let me just, let me just get back to that. Yeah, yeah. Amanda, please. I, I may be reading this wrong, but original. So I have two, one question, two supporting 
adding my support. One, adding my support for um, Ernest's previous comment about about or making suggested language changes so that it's more broader um, and actually addresses the issue of transcript withholdings. Um, so support that and support in whatever comes forward to make that stronger and actually actually applicable to students and their lives um, instead of just kind of making it a mention there. Um, in specific narrow instances, we don't want those narrowed instances. We want to be make sure it's actually solving the problem that's at hand here, which is a continuous. It's continuing to be a larger and larger problem. Um, and then uh, so to my question, and then I have a suggestion, a question on um, Romana, I, uh, the submission of a teach out plan or agreement to me that reads and like just correct me if I'm wrong, just for it's more for clarifying purposes. Does this mean that an institution can submit a teach out plan? And. But not an agreement or they could submit an agreement and not and verse, you know, they could do either or um, I'm just I'm concerned about. I just and also like teach out plan. Is that referencing to other regulations that clarify the details of what should be included in that teach out plan? Um, so I'm just more so I'm concerned about articulation agreements and ensuring that the transfer of credits, whatever is actually actually can be used um, by the student because in for profit colleges, we know that for the most part when schools close, or you know, students realize that their credits are actually like non-viable when they're trying to transfer or trying to maybe re-enroll after they're trying to get a second chance um, after they've learned that their school was a fraud or misled them. Um, they try to go back to school. They can't because they're starting from zero. So I'm just wondering how strong that language needs to be and if there's any holes there on teach out plans specifically, and then clarifying my understanding of do they can they submit a plan just and that's 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 all that covers it or is there an agreement with institutions with the department on how exactly that plan is going to go um and then my suggestion is to add another list point here of ensuring federal civil rights laws are um applicable that they're applied that if the secretary 30 seconds remaining amanda that's that was just my I, I could submit more language, but I just want to add a different a separate additional list point to ensure that federal civil rights laws are being monitored at all institutions and that can be added here in this part. Uh, yeah, with respect to civil rights laws, we'll we'll, we'll take that back. Um, uh, the uh, teach up plan is as is, is, um, you know, that would be an actual plan as, as a, uh, uh, a plan. The school ha has an actual plan for teach out, which is differentiated from a teach out agreement. Um, so I don't I I'm not sure exactly what you're asking there. We, we are just requiring we would be requiring from the school a uh, the actual plan it has to to execute that 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 teach out um, is what we're looking for there to see that students have some um, uh, mechanism for uh, completing their uh, their uh, their program. Oh, the records retention uh, citation I I just got. I don't know why I couldn't find it. You know, when you're nervous when you're talking, you can't find it. It's always in my head, but I it slipped out. It's 668.24 is the section on records retention. Okay, you got that? Have you heard that? Excellent. OK, uh, Brad, go ahead. Thank you. Um, in the conversions, section 9, subsection F, paragraphs 1 and 2, the wording stating, quote, other conditions that the secretary may deem appropriate, quote, seems to create a sort of purgatory for institutions that convert from for profit to nonprofit status. Seems like the department could delay forever on improving an institution's request to convert to a nonprofit status. Generally speaking, it does not seem like keeping a school in limbo for an extended period is fair to the organization. But I also want to highlight the long term uncertainty typically stresses organizations because it undermines efforts to plan and use resources most efficiently. This will be bad for schools, their students, their employees and the communities they serve. The department has two years of audit financial statements, compliance audits, and they are acceptable and they meet the other metrics here stated for two years. 
then the department should agree to let the conversion and let the school move on. Let the, approve the conversion and let the school move on. I just want to note in the, the chat, if folks could, could, I think we just want to finish up with with uh, G before we head up, we head off to um, uh, to F or E. Apologies. Um, I'm sorry. Fred, you're, you're, yeah, that's okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, so my comment was in F. So sure, sure. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, so Carolyn. Um, thank you, and I, I just wanted to really quickly reiterate that these conditions are things that the department already has authority to do. They're just providing ex sort of extra notice through this reg. So um, to, to Brad's point when he was objecting about the possibility that they could, the department could impose a condition to review marketing, that's already something that exists in the department's authority. This is just articulating it to provide notice to um, schools that might be subject to it after they've been found to have um, potential problems. But anyway, I, I, I also just wanted to add for the department's consideration that there are um, other conditions that they might uh, consider adding to the list. Um, so for example, if a school has um, in a program review or through an investigation by um, a state or a federal agency been found to have um, significant issues, um, including, for example, related to uh, student outcomes, um, it might make sense to include um, requirements to report on um, Things like graduation, retention rates, um, or other similar metrics, and to um, even have to improve those if that's if that's a problem as part of a condition of a, of a provisional certification. Thank you. All right, uh, Yael, please. Uh, just very briefly, to the point about marketing, I just want to note that this is this is maybe like the number one thing that we see institutions, for-profit institutions in particular, doing that just results in catastrophic harms to borrowers. I think it's essential the department maintain the authority that it already has, to Carolyn's point, to be uh, uh, thoughtful and aware of these issues and play a role where there are real risks to ensure that schools can't defraud students and that particularly schools at risk of precipitous closure can't use marketing uh, materials in a manner that um, mis you know, provides material and and um, and information to students that's simply incorrect and that misleads them and deceives them into enrolling in schools that they shouldn't be enrolling in. To Brad's point about conversions, I think it's worth noting um, that there are many inherent risks associated with for-profit to nonprofit conversions, and more than that, that these transactions can take many different forms and raise unique concerns. The department should prioritize making sure that it has as much discretion as possible to have uh, case specific requirements associated with these types of conversions. Thank you. Uh, Barm. Yeah, just a quick point that the mere sub on T-chart plans, it shouldn't be just a mere submission of a T-chart plan, any T-chart plan, no matter how science fiction it may be. It has to be a teacher plan that is acceptable to the secretary, to the accreditor, and to the authorizer. Thank you. Um, uh, Jessica, please. I was just going to add for potential inclusion on the list of E <laughs> uh, prohibition on participating in ATB programs to the extent we're worried about, you know, we want ATB programs to be the best that they can be. I think maybe pro the secretary's discretion to prohibit some schools on provisional PPAs for participating would make sense to me. Uh, great, Greg, do you want to do a quick uh, quick temperature check on E and then move right into the F? Sounds good, Brady. Excellent. All right. If people could hold up those thumbs nice and high at the center of their screen, a temperature check on the entirety of section E as currently read. Thank you. I do see one thumb down. You are more than welcome to come off of mute and add anything new. All right, great. Thank you. So moving right along to F. Uh, Greg and Aaron, do you want to briefly tee us up for that section? Yes. Thank you, That's Aaron. Thank you. So we are moving to section F. If a proprietary institution seeks to convert to nonprofit status following a change in ownership, the following conditions will apply to the institution following the change of ownership. In addition to any other conditions 
the secretary may deem appropriate. The institution must continue to meet the requirements uh, under 668.28a and 668.28b until the department has accepted, reviewed, and approved the institution's financial statements and compliance audits that cover two complete consecutive fiscal years with passing 9010 reporting under its new ownership or until the department approves the institution's request to convert to a nonprofit status, whichever is later. The department must continue, the institution rather, must continue to meet the gainful employment requirements of subpart Q of this part until the department has accepted, reviewed, and approved the institution's financial statements and compliance audits that cover two complete consecutive fiscal years under its new ownership or until the department approves the institution's request to convert to nonprofit status, whichever is later. And the institution will be required to submit regular and timely reports on agreements entered into with its former for-profit owner or affiliated or related persons or entities, so long as the institution participates as a nonprofit institution. And that's the entirety of us. So I'll open it up for comment. Okay. All right, opening up for any comments. Okay. Um, with that, and noting that uh, Brad, we did we did previously hear your 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 comment. Um, do we want to take a temperature check on this? Go ahead. Excellent. I do just want to note that Johnson is in for legal aid, so I apologize for missing, missing that initially. But welcome to the table, Johnson. So, if I could again see people's thumbs for section uh, the entirety of section F. Seeing one thumb down, uh, Brad, anything you'd like to add? As, as stated for the committee, but just to be clear, I like that one through three are measurable items to achieve. You know, I, I haven't opined on whether or not I agree with them, but at least they're measurable. Um, the concern is in addition to other conditions the secretary may deem appropriate as an unmeasurable item. I do not know what that means. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and so, Greg, I know that we have section G, and then I'm scrolling down. We have that one um, area of deletion. Uh, do you want to briefly walk us through G, and then do you want to in incorporate the deletion in our discussion? Uh, I can just say about G is we've just relettered the paragraphs. Uh, okay. We haven't done anything there, so uh, I think we can we can move on to 668.43. Okay. Um, so, Aaron, if you want to. Share the document 668.43 institutional information. So here we are in um, 668.43 uh, A5 institutional information that the institution must make readily available to enroll the prospective students. Under this subpart includes, but is not limited to, uh, the academic program of the institution, including all the uh, Romanets you see there, and going down to Romanet 5, which we have deleted, um, reminding you that in 668.14 uh, uh, B32, we propose to require all programs that lead to occupations requiring programmatic accreditation or state licensure to meet those requirements that renders a disclosure unnecessary. It required disclosures about states in which the institution did not meet, um, uh, did, did or did not meet the licensure requirements. Thus, we propose to eliminate the language in the disclosure section of the regulations. I will stipulate that I we've heard uh, the comments that there might be other disclosures which we should consider uh, in lieu of this, and we've got that language um, that th those requests. Um, this only has to do with uh, deleting the actual disclosure language uh, that relates to the uh, uh, requiring our program. Well, what this required was um, the in informing students of whether or not they met. But if we're going to require that they do, that this specific disclosure would become redundant. So um, I'll uh, open the floor for discussion on this. On 668.43. Great, uh, Kelly, I see your hand first. Thank you. Um, I'd, ac I'd actually like to go back. I don't know if I was sleeping and I missed it, but I thought G was new and E was renamed to H. So where it starts 
if an institution is initially certified as a nonprofit institution. Um, just two points of clear questions, actually, and clarification. Um, in G, where it talks about the following conditions will apply if an institution upon initial certification or following the change in ownership. And then it goes on to say, in addition to any other conditions that the secretary may deem appropriate, what is what what is the intent there, I guess? And then my second question is in two in that section where it talks about that the institution will submit regular and timely reports as it relates to taxes for how long? Is that until the certification is approved? Uh, Ronnie, so the so the re-lettering, that's just a re -letter, yeah, we we re-lettered the paragraphs and, and just so um e became h but but, but what about g because in my document it's red text which to me means it's it's new right or oh did I, do you know what you're, you're absolutely right we i i i uh elided g didn't i did we i don't think we discussed g did we i think, I think we breezed, breezed by it yeah yeah i am very sorry about that you're absolutely correct about that um did you um your other comments i'm, I'm sorry i was I, I really apologize for for that omission. Um, must be by the end of the week, my eyes are starting to starting to give away. Did you have Did you have other Did you have any um Were your comments related to anything above G? I just want to make sure. No, no, it's all it's all in G. Okay, I'm sorry, my mistake. So let's go back and review G then. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, my my mistake, and I offer wholehearted apologies for that. Uh, so let's uh, not skip G at all. Not my intention. Um, if an institution initially certified as a nonprofit institution or it has undergone a change of ownership and seeks to convert to nonprofit status the following conditions will apply to the institution upon initial certification or following the change of ownership in addition to any other conditions the secretary may deem appropriate uh, the institution will be required to submit regular and timely reports on a creditor and state authorization agency actions and any new servicing agreements until the department has accepted, reviewed and approved the institution's financial statements and compliance audits that cover two complete consecutive fiscal years following the initial certification or two complete fiscal years under its new ownership until the department approves the institution's request to convert to a uh, nonprofit status, whichever is later. And the institution will be required to submit regular and timely reports on communications from the Internal Revenue Service or any other state or or foreign country related to tax exempt or nonprofit status, so long as the institution continues to participate as a nonprofit institution. So, and uh, your your question related to the uh, uh, required to submit timely, regular and timely reports that would be for the duration of the time it chooses to it, it wants to participate as nonprofit. So that there's no time limit on that. Um, and then I'm sorry, I'll, we'll go back and can you review your other comments on G that you had? Because I've. Uh, yeah, I can, but, but if we can stick with two just based on your response, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following what that means as far as for the entire time that it was, wishes to participate as a nonprofit institution. I mean, I mean, I'm just not understanding this. We want to, we want to be, able, so if there's any communications between um, any, um, between the IRS or the, uh, or the uh, revenue service of any other uh, um, country that relates to that tax exempt status, uh, we, we want to see it if it affects the tax rate, if it affects the uh, status of that um, organization uh, as tax exempt or nonprofit. So, okay, I mean, so because that could happen at any, that could happen. I mean, there, there are the actions we take, there are actions that those bodies take. And if they were to, some action that they took could, could hypothetically affect uh, the status as a nonprofit organization. So, we would want to see that regardless okay. of when it so occurred. Specifically as it relates to the nonprofit status. Okay. Um, my other question was in, in G itself. And the the last few words in that, as it relates to in addition to any other conditions that the secretary may deem appropriate. Um, because I'm reading this as it, it has to do with upon initial certification or change in ownership. Can you give an example of another condition that might be beyond those two? Off the top of my head, I can't think. I'll, I'll turn it over to Steve. Maybe he has an example of, of, of one or two he could offer. Sure. Um, some can, some some types of restrictions for initial certification. Uh, they're provisionally certified institutions 
are required usually to apply for new location approval for new locations or to add new programs beyond the scope of their existing accreditation. In some circumstances, if there were concerns about the application, there might be a prohibition for a certain time period before they would even be allowed to apply to add uh, a new location or a new program. So it, it really is tied to the specifics of the applications. And this is just to note that there can be additional, and that's that's already done, right? That's already a, inherent in the, the authority of the department to impose limitations on initial approvals or, or even recertifications or changes of ownership. Okay, thank you. Again, thank you, Kelly, for pointing out the uh, the omission. It was very important. I was sleeping on my roles as a facilitator. Uh, Greg, I don't see any other uh, hands for G. Uh, do we want to do a quick temperature check on that? Uh, yes, please. Let's do a temperature check on that since we did not do that earlier. <laughs> All right, another one. If people want to put their thumbs right in the center of their screen, just hold them up just so we can take note. Where the committee is at this point. All right, not seeing any thumbs down. Um, so thank you. And thank you again, Kelly, for, for pointing that out. Um, now, Greg, do you want to now I'm going to scroll down on my end to that last section 68.43? Yeah, I, I think we already went over that. And I, yeah. I uh, we went and I just wanted to acknowledge I know we had some comments before where we when we went over that in 668.14. B32, but if somebody else has uh, something additional they'd like to say, uh, uh, understanding that we do, we have heard the concern about other disclosures which may be necessary. Uh, Jessica, who just want to know is back in for uh, legal aid, please. Thanks, yeah, I just want to, I think it's slightly different than what people said earlier, and I think it really goes back to the point Carolyn made, but, um, you know, we I think we've talked about requiring licensure for the where the school is located or where it is state authorized or potentially even where it teaches students, so including this and that. But there are all sorts of circumstances in which, you know, a student is living in Indiana but intends to move to Massachusetts after graduation. And even if they're attending a school in Indiana, actually knowing that they can't get the job in Massachusetts may be relevant. So I would not reflexively cut these. I not the world's biggest fan of disclosures. I'm not sure this is not the best way to get the job done. I think the other part is, but there still may be room here um, because students move. So that's the reality. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Greg, I'm not seeing anything else. So we want to wrap up issue paper number six with a quick check on 668.43. Yes. Okay. All right. And we all want to do it. We're all very excited. Thumbs right middle of the screen, nice and high. I am not seeing any thumbs down. Great. OK. Thank you very much. Um, Greg, do you want to move us right into number seven, 9010 rule? Yes, but uh, just give me like a minute here to pull that up and, and for uh, um, Aaron and Vanessa to get that up on the screen. And as that happens, I just want to uh, let everyone know that Travis is coming to the table on behalf of uh, service members and vets. Uh, Jalen's coming to the table on behalf of consumer advocacy groups. Uh, Johnson is back uh, for legal aid organizations, and Carney is going to be in for students and student loan borrowers. So welcome to, to that group for joining us. And Greg, whenever you are ready, I think Aaron has the document up. OK, um, what better way to close off? Friday and, and the end of our first round of discussions, then with uh, 9010. So we are looking at issue paper number seven again, title for uh, revenue and uh, non-federal education assistance funds. You can see that for those of you who are familiar with the, um, the current um, uh, section of the regulation that we have renamed it uh, to accommodate uh, the statutory change. So uh, we uh, provide the uh, um, applicable statutory <coughs> citation and the regulatory citation in 668.28. One offer up front that for those of you uh, familiar with 9010, we are not providing a uh, uh, Appendix C at this point. Appendix C is the actual uh, methodology for calculating 9010, so we will be providing that um, at the next 
uh, at the next session. So let's begin with a, a summary of the issues. And we reference section two, uh, 2013 of the American Rescue Plan that amended the applicable statute to require at least 10% of a proprietary institution's revenues to be derived from sources other than federal educational assistance funds. This change means that the numerator of the revenue calculation, which formerly consisted only of Title IV funds, will now include federal funds that are dispersed or delivered to or on behalf of a student, which we will define collectively as federal educational assistance funds. We propose to amend 34 CFR 668-28 to account for the statutory language, or statutory change rather, requiring that a proprietary institution's revenue be derived from sources other than federal educational assistance funds. Additionally, we are proposing changes to 34 CFR 668.28 that would close existing loopholes in the 9010 calculation and provide clarification on the treatment of revenue. Specifically, those changes would designate as federal educational assistance funds any educational assistance for students sent directly to the institution by the awarding agency as well as funds that flow directly to students where the authorizing federal agency provides funding data to the institution. And we note as part of our implementation, the department would create data sharing arrangements with federal agencies to provide student level funding data to institutions, including funds paid directly to students by that awarding agency. We would publish an annual notice in the federal register indicating which agencies have such an arrangement. Monitoring the current requirement in 34 CFR 668-28A4 with respect to Title IV program funds, federal educational assistance funds dispersed or delivered to or on behalf of a student would be presumed to pay the student's tuition fees or other institutional charges regardless of whether the institution credits the funds to the student's account or pays the funds directly to the student, except to the extent that the student's tuition fees or other charges are satisfied by the sources identified in 668 28A4 Romanet I through Romanet 4 referred to in the 9010 calculation as funds received first. This would include those funds paid directly to students by awarding agencies up to the amount of cash payments made to the institution by the student. We propose to disallow the sale of receivables, including from institutional loans, as non federal educational assistance revenue. Section 47D1B of the HEA requires that in performing a 9010 calculation, an institution may only include revenue as revenue, those funds generated by the institution from tuition fees and other institutional charges for students enrolled in programs eligible for assistance under the Title IV programs. Activities conducted by the institution that are necessary for the education and training of the institution students or certain non eligible training programs. Revenue that results from the sale of receivables is not derived from tuition or fees or other institutional charges for students enrolled in a program uh, eligible for federal education assistance and does not indicate a willingness on the part of the student to pay cash for a portion of their programs. We would also require institutions to award, disperse, and request Title IV funds according to established parameters. Loss of eligibility under 9010 occurs only after two consecutive years of failing rates because 34 CFR part 668 imposes no time frame for requesting federal funds. Institutions can avoid a loss of eligibility under 9010 by deferring drawdowns of Title IV funds from G5, which is the mechanism through which institutions request funds until the subsequent fiscal year. We propose to address this loophole by adding a disbursement rule requiring proprietary institutions to disperse funds to eligible students and request those funds from G5 prior to the end of the institution's fiscal year. We would also limit the revenues from activities conducted by the institution to those derived from such activities necessary for the education and training of a student. Under the HEA, institutions may count as revenue activities conducted by the institution that are necessary for the education and training of the institution students. Only funds generated from services provided by students may count as revenue for 9010 purposes. Such revenue does not include revenue derived from product sales. Proposed changes to 34 CFR 668-28 would require that institutional accounting records clearly identify the service revenue not related to product sales. That is unique to the service activities performed by the student in the program and necessary for the education of those students. Finally, we would clarify under what circumstances 
funds paid by a student or on behalf of a student by a party other than the institution for an education or training program that is not an eligible program may count as revenue for 9010 purposes. We propose that only the funds generated from non eligible programs offered at the eligible institution. I'm sorry, offered at the eligible location of the institution where the institution itself provides the education may be counted as non federal educational assistance revenue for the purposes of 9010. This would preclude revenue from programs where the institution merely provides facilities for test preparation courses, acts as a proctor, or oversees a course of self study. So with that, I'm going to move into the regulatory text itself, our proposed red lines. And we're looking at um, 668.28. We see the change there reflecting the statutory. Um, uh, the statutory changes, and we note that here and throughout the paper, we have changed references to non title for revenue from non title for revenue rather to non federal revenue, and this does incorporate those statutory changes. So I'll begin with um, a a one calculating the revenue percentage. A proprietary institution meets the requirements in 668.14 B 16 that at least 10% of its revenue is derived from sources other than federal funds by using the formula in Appendix C, which I referenced earlier of this subpart to calculate its revenue percentage for the latest complete fiscal year. For purposes of this section, for any annual audit submission for a proprietary institution, uh, institution's fiscal year beginning on or after January 1, 2023, federal funds used to calculate the revenue percentage include Title IV HEA program funds and any other educational assistance funds provided by a federal agency directly to an institution or student. The secretary identifies the federal agency and the other educational assistance funds provided by that agency in a notice that will be published in the Federal Register. For any fiscal year beginning prior to January 1, 2023, federal funds are limited to Title IV HDA funds. And I'll, because this is a pretty dense yeah, uh, you want to pause, yeah. section, I'm going to pause here and allow discussion on what we just talked about in A1. All right. Any comments or questions from the committee on uh, paragraph A, subparagraph one? Uh, Bradley, please. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, 9010 negotiations on a Friday afternoon. Can't, can't imagine a better way to spend our day. It's an accountant's dream, I, I must say. But uh, I just got to start with an opening statement and I'll have various comments because this is a proprietary school issue. So uh, nonetheless, I have to begin <clears throat> by stating on the record that we are strongly opposed to the entire 9010 concept. That being said, we understand that 9010 is statutory. The rule does not protect students or promote institutional excellence. To be clear, there is no demonstrated relationship between the quality of an institution and how its students pay for their education. There are, however, numerous destructive consequences of this rule. It incentivizes schools to turn away health students that are most in need and master's and doctoral graduate program students borrowing grad plus loans and instead seeks out those who are less likely to need aid or represent a credit risk. It requires institutions and the government to dedicate an extraordinary amount of time and resources to understanding, complying with, and enforcing the rule instead of allocating those resources, better programs, and enforcement of quality assurance programs and metrics that are proven to work. That being said, given this impacts proprietary schools, I'll have several comments throughout this agreement and I'll get back in line. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to make a brief note of some folks who've just joined us. I want to welcome uh, Jamie uh, back to the table as well as Emmanuel on behalf of private nonprofits. So with that, Travis, go ahead. Hi, thank you. I also wanted to, to make an opening statement about um, 9010 from our perspective of the service member and veterans and who this rule has, um, this loophole has kind of affected over the years or has affected over the years. Um, First of all, closing the 9010 loophole has been one of the top education, if not the top education priority for uh, a large number of service member of, of organizations that represent service members, veterans, and family members, um, and military connected students. Um, and we're very happy that we, the loophole 
is closed and that all federal funds will be counted and we're here to ensure that uh, it's closed shut tight. Uh, you know, the post 11 GI Bill is a massively popular program from my organization, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Uh, over 90% of our members utilize it in some way. Um, it's truly transformational. Um, I wouldn't have gone to school personally without it. I know many veterans that wouldn't have gone to school without this program. Um, and that's just the GI Bill, it's not, not to even um, include DOD tuition assistance, spousal assistance programs and things like that, that um, really help our community. Um, however, when this loophole was open, it also put a target on the backs of veterans and service members and their families um, by having these predatory schools really target them for just the GI Bill dollars to not be included and um, to, so they could you know, recruit other uh, non um, GI Bill students, um, which has really put a target on our back and victimized many members of our community. Um, you know, this rule was put into place to ensure that schools are being good stewards of taxpayer funds and we ensure that the money only goes to schools that pass these uh, market tests. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that uh, Congress intended all federal funds, including the DOD and GI Bill and VA money to be included. Um, and we're here to ensure that's going to happen. And uh, thank you. And I'll get back online for some more comments. Thanks, Travis. And just to clarify the question in chat, we, we are um, only we are trying to limit comments only to section to number one of that first section. So as much as negotiators can. But with that, Jalen, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. So we are very supportive of closing the loophole to protect the GI Bill recipients and happy to see this draft language. However, we are still concerned that opening up the new loopholes related to institutional um, private loans, which we are, which included later on in the regulation. We also would like to get clarification on how the EVT grants for students coming from foster care systems will be treated as those are our federal law, federal funds that are being administered through the throughout the states. So if you guys can just touch about on that part as well, please. Um, as far as the uh, the grants you're referring to, uh, we we uh, <clears throat> we're still in the process of uh, of identifying all the uh, potential sources for uh, of federal funds to an institution. Um, it is it is and beyond that, as I pointed out before, um, <clears throat> ninety ten. In order to do a ninety ten calculation, it is necessary to know uh, what was received uh, at the student level by, by each individual student. Otherwise, you cannot calculate 9010. It can't. It does. It, it does aggregate, but it can't be calculated on an aggregate basis up front. So you can't just know how the amount of funding an institution received from a source. It has to be broken down by student, and in many cases, um, and, and the institution has to be informed of that. Uh, would have to know that. Um, certainly, the institution would know on a in any case where a um, where the agency providing the funds just gave them to the institution to disperse, but where those funds go to the student, the school would not be aware of that unless the agency had a mechanism for that. So we have a we do have a ways to go with a, with our identifications and also putting into place uh, protocols through which schools would be notified of those amounts. So I can't speak to any particular any particular funding uh, source uh, right now. Um, you had another part of your question too. I can't recall what that was. I'm sorry. Could you reiterate that or restate that, please? I think you're muted right now, Jalen. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Pretty much the other part of the question was closing this loophole for the GI Bill, which is a great thing, but we're often concerned that it is going to open up more loopholes for related to institutional private loans as well. Um, Yes, we do have we do have concerns about uh, obviously that we're uh, um, about 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 steering you know steering students into um, into private loans. However, I, I would point out that um, it's a program violation to uh, not to uh, um, allow a student access to all of the Title IV aid to which he or she is entitled. Um, so it, it's not appropriate for a school to say to a, stu to a student, um, you know, we're not going to uh, uh, originate your loan up to the uh, level of uh, eligibility for um, 
for Title IV in order that we can steer you into a some type of a private instrument. So that would be, I'm not saying that some schools might not try to do that, but it, but it would be a program violation to the extent that we're aware of it. Uh, we would uh, we would take action against the institution that did that. Thank you. Uh, Carney, welcome and please take three minutes. I just uh, really quickly, um, I want to add on to um, Travis's opening statement. Um, I'm representing students and student loan borrowers, but I'm also a veteran that used the GI Bill. Um, I'm really supportive of closing any and all loopholes. Um, these predatory colleges also um, really take advantage of students that are first generation, a lot of first generation veteran students and other students that uh, don't really understand the kind of college recruitment process. They think they're being recruited by better colleges than they might actually be. Um, so I really just want to make sure that we're closing the loophole and uh, protecting all students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brad, please. And thank you for your service, Carney. Um, you know, I, I did add just real quickly in the chat that not all veteran service organizations agree with the 9010 change. There was a, a veterans education uh, project paper that I put in there for the department to take a look at. Um, <clears throat> so, so moving into this is kind of section one and section two, so I'm, I'll combine it here. The department seems to be proposing that federal assistant funds paid directly to students would be counted in 90 without regard to whether the funds were actually provided to the to the school uh, to pay for tuition fees and other institutional charges. There are basic programs like Montgomery GI Bill benefits and some post 9-11 GI BAH, which stands for Basic Allowance for Housing, does not have tuition in the word, that provides significant amounts for housing, cost of living, and other expenses that are clearly not tuition fees and institutional charges. Depending on your zip code, that can be up to $1,700 per month. It would be completely inappropriate to include these funds in the calculation. It goes against the basic accounting matching principle we all learned in college. Given the cash being used in the calculation may not be associated, would not be associated with the revenue being reported in the denominator. All the funds counted in 9010 must have been provided to the school by the student for tuition fees and other institutional charges. And the amount must be kept at the cash payments actually received from the student, not what the student received. Also, under Title 34 CFR section 668.28, subsection C, paragraph 3, institutions are required to report to the department within 45 days after their fiscal year end if they failed the 9010 rule. The department isn't proposing changing that reporting requirement as part of this issue paper. After living through gainful employment with the department, I'm concerned that the department won't have the ability to get institutions data timely. And the VA is typically the last federal fund source to put a ledger card for students. If the department doesn't get disbursement data from the VA and share with institutions in real time, how can institutions be expected to comply with this 45 day reporting requirement? Does the department have a master service agreement already in place with the department guaranteeing they will get this data in time to get it to institutions to complete their 9010 calculation? Remember, the 9010 has to be audited as well. So we would really need that before the end of our fiscal year. If institutions get a uh, get data a month or two after disbursement, we could be in a significant situation where we can't comply with the 9010 rule until after 40 to five days of our fiscal year. And you have 30 seconds. Thus remaining. effectively precluding us from completing the reporting requirement. Is the department planning to address this? Does the department intend on sharing this disbursement data with institutions in real time? How can an institution plan for their end of the fiscal year if they're not guaranteed to get this data on a real time basis? This will really hamstring our ability to monitor 9010 compliance. What's the department's plan and timing expectation on sharing data with institutions? Um, definitely hear your concerns. That's a lot of questions. Uh, I think maybe 20 years ago, I could have remembered all of in my head. Uh, I'll try to, uh, to address your overriding concern, which is the, uh, uh, first of all, I, I do want to say that the, that the uh, amount that will, that will be counted towards 9010 that is, um, that uh, that is received directly by students will be uh, capped at the amount of cash the student actually pays. So we're what we're basically doing here is presuming the amount of cash the student pays to have come from those sources. Um, if I just those sources exist. Uh, secondly, with res yes, I, I'm just I'm not following that. So you're saying that you'll know how much money the student paid us out of their $1,700 check? 
No, we won't know that. Uh, you will. But how do we know that came from the would be a dollars and not another job? I'm sorry. Yeah, that is, that, that, there is a presumption currently in the regulations that if the student received, if the student received funding from that from that source and the, and was paid and and then the student paid cash to the institution, the presumption that that cash payment um, came from that source up to the amount of of that source. And the core, the cash source is called basic allowance for housing. That's that's considered a presumption for tuition. Under the current, under the way the reg, under, not the current, under the way the regulation is currently proposed. Uh, yes, there'd be no delineation. Do you, you can see if you're making a suggestion that it be uh, that are you making the suggestion that where the uh, where the source is identified as being a specific to say housing allowance that that would be that would be excluded completely. That would be a good starting point, but there's more than that. We'll take um, how about the 45 days? Yeah, well, I was, just, I was going to address that with uh, with respect to, to the timeliness there. Uh, we are not changing that. Um, our, our intention is to uh, our intention is not to require schools to be aware of um, funding sources where they have not been made, where it has not been uh, made known to them what the uh, amount of the uh, award received by each student is. And that's why we are going to uh, not make a blanket requirement. Uh, but are rather saying that we will identify in the Federal Register each year those sources that the school is required to be aware of, and we would not do that until um, we have executed some type of a arrangement with that entity to provide data, not just to the department, but to provide that to the school. So they'd be aware of that. Um, we are aware of the timeliness issues involved with that, and uh, the fact that it would not be of use to a school if that information only came, you know, months after uh, after the aid was actually uh, dispersed to the student by that entity. But I want to give my counsel Steve an opportunity to uh, to expand on that if, if he wants to. Yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, that needs any expansion right now. You know, input on uh, how these items should be treated is welcome and will be considered. Okay, Thanks, thank Steve. you. Uh, Johnson, please. Yeah, I have two comments. Uh, Jalen's concerned about you know the the private student loan market entering this area is is completely valid. Uh, Navian just recently settled a case um, for um, I think they out, the output was a one point two billion dollars worth of private loans um, that it, it enabled more money to flow to. Um, schools and, and the value of those loans was so de minimis. I think they valued at 50 million afterwards. So there's a whole there's a whole history of the private loans trying to, you know, make 9010 work for for profits and, and having a bad effect on uh, borrowers. So um, that's one statement. And just to address Brad's concerns, you know, I have a client who uh, could have gone to FIT, which is the 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 Fashion Institute in New York, which you know, uses its moniker to Im imitate MIT. I mean, it's really a great place. And instead, she went to the um, she went to the Art Institute, um, and she took out all these loans. Uh, and she could have taken out all the loans and gone to FIT and maybe taken out less loans. I mean, the marketplace is designed to attract people in certain places. Her degree hasn't really worked out, um, and and the idea that. Um, you know the that we shouldn't be using these sort of ideas that people are, are voting with their feet as to where they go to school and that should have an impact on whether um, you should continue to receive funding um, and their pocketbooks I, it just it seems a little bit of a contradiction I, I want to say just quickly that um, you know we, I am, the department is fully aware that the what we're proposing here is not going to address um, every concern about, you know, uh, and, and concerns that we share, by the way, about increasing, uh, you know, private lending or, or students students seeking those sources as a as an as an alternative to Title IV. I can only reiterate that there was here um, that if if an institution, because of these rules, decided to um, uh, try to steer students who were eligible for Title IV funding into other instruments, that would be a that would be a violation. I 
I don't know what the uh, what the, what the Veterans Administration rules are or DOD. I, I would assume there would be grave consequences for a school that purposefully did not enroll veterans uh, in order to uh, to uh, avoid the consequences of this. So while that might happen, I'm certain that would be that would be a violation. So I, I don't think what I'm trying to say is I don't think these rules that we're proposing here, while they might not fix all the problems being identified, I, I do not believe they exacerbate them. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Travis, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure that I read um, my colleague Barmack's comments that are in the chat just for, for everybody that's um, watching and can't read the chat. Um, just to point out that the organization that was cited earlier um, is an outlier. Uh, we've been endorsed by 28 veterans, um, military and family member related organizations, um, and this has broad support within the veteran and military community. Um, and I also wanted to touch on that the housing allowance, um, that it's it's incorrect to state that the housing allowance should be excluded um, as evidenced by the statutory text, inserting federal funds, federal funds that are dispersed or delivered to or on behalf of a student to be used and to attend such institution, um, referred to as paragraph subsection D as federal education assistance funds. Students are getting the housing allowance to be used only if they attend the institutions um, and exclusion of the housing allowance is not supported by the statute. Um, and then I also would like to mention um, in Romanet 1 that, you know, we list Title IV um, and HEA program funds and I, I think we've already discussed a little bit that uh, the department is aware of, you know, large sources of other federal funds that assist students, such as the GI Bill and DOD, coming from VA and um, VA and DOD, and that it would, um, I think it would be helpful to list those explicitly rather than have them rely on uh, a list that comes out every year from the department, um, and just have that explicitly stated. And these other federal funds that you've identified, which I think you've already touched on. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Thanks. Um, and Travis touched on a point that I wanted to make, only I might make it a little stronger, which is that I think it's cynical to suggest removal of housing assistance that's specifically intended to help students get an education. And I would urge the department not to take that recommendation. Um, but beyond that, I wanted to um, just raise a concern about the notice the department um, is proposing making annually. And that my fear about that notice, though I see that it could be a useful um, aid to schools and I'm not opposed to that, is that I want it to be clear that that doesn't take away the school's responsibility to be their own diligence and counselor. And in the event that there are changes in the interim, and schools are aware of different sources of federal funding that might become available to students. Um, and that students are intending to use, it, it is concerning to me the notion that a, a document that might become static um, or not be updated in real time um, or not be entirely comprehensive for one reason or another may uh, ultimately um, create a loophole in itself. Thank you. All right, Greg, shall we take a quick check on uh, just number one, that calculating the revenue percentage and then move on to disbursement rule? We need to check them in on every, do a temperature check on every item we can, but. No, I don't think we need to do a temperature check just on that. I'll move, I just wanted to, just, I wanted to open up discussion for that because I wanted to just, you know, get some discussion going before we went too far, you know, deep into the text. So I didn't want it to be a recitation on my part. I, I just wanted to get some so we can we'll move on and I'll, I'll, we can call for a. Uh, um, I think we'll wait a little bit longer before we before we do a. Uh, I just love temperature checks. Do we want to do you want to queue Aaron up for a uh, disbursement rule? Yes. Yeah, I like temperature checks as well. No, not trying to disparage temperature checks. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you, Aaron. So you'll see here in, uh, in two that uh, I, I want to point out that uh, the cash basis of accounting is still the method for uh, calculating 9010. That's that story. That's not been changed by what you see lined out there. Um, we have uh, proposed this new disbursement rule, 
and and we do say here an institution must use the cash basis of accounting and calculating its revenue percentage. Um, always a bit of a problem when you know I remember that my first exposure to 9010 if you've ever had well I'm sure if you have had advanced accounting courses they talk about cash basis but in the basic ones you're just always taught to you know you're taught to think about accrual basis accounting so it's kind of hard to uh, at first, kind of hard to divorce yourself from that, but it, um, but we are talking about cash basis here. So um, for each eligible student, counting the amount of non-title for, uh, I should say rather, institution must use the cash basis of accounting and calculating its revenue percentage by for each eligible student, counting the amount of non-title for federal funds the institution received during its fiscal year, directly from an agency identified in A1 uh, Romanet 1 of this section, which we said we would do annually in the Federal Register and tuition and fees and other institutional charges uh, paid by a student to whom the federal agency provided funds. For each student, for each eligible student, counting the amount of Title IV uh, HEA program funds received uh, during the fiscal year. However, before the end of its fiscal year, the institution must request funds under the advanced payment method in 668-162-B2 or the heightened cash monitoring method in 668-162-D1 that students are eligible to receive and make any disbursements to those students by the end of the fiscal year or make disbursements to those students by the end of the fiscal year and report as federal funds in the revenue calculations the funds that the students are eligible to receive before requesting those funds under the reimbursement or heightened cash management methods in 668.162C or D2. So um, we note here that uh, uh, for each eligible student, the institution can count, um, the institution uh, counts the amount of non title four federal funds received during the fiscal year, including those funds received directly from another agency, as well as those uh, that are received um, uh, from a student. And for each eligible student, the institution count the total Title IV funds received during the fiscal year, except that on those institutions, um, uh, except that inst an institution on heightened cash management uh, must first, uh, uh, or on advance pay, must first must request and disperse Title IV funds by the end of the fiscal year. Because 34, and the reason for this is because 34 C uh, CFR Part 668 uh, imposes no time frame for the requesting of federal funds. Institutions can avoid a loss of eligibility under 9010 by deferring drawdowns of Title IV funds from G5 until the subsequent fiscal year. And so what we're trying to do in this language is close that loophole. And we have seen several instances of schools using this um, uh, this loophole, which is currently does not violate anything in regulation to avoid the consequences of 9010. And again, it's because of the, you know, you have to you have to um, fail 9010 in two years each in each of two years, which makes this makes this gaming possible by simply remember we're talking about cash basis of accounting here. So you just delay the draw of cash into the next year when the accounting starts again. So I hope I've explained that and uh, I will open the floor for discussion on this disbursement rule. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Aaron. Just want to let everyone know that Barmac is back at the table on behalf of service members and uh, groups representing veterans. But Brad, please take us away. Thank you. And cash basis of accounting, I, that does bring me back, Greg. It does. Um, all right, so I'm, I apologize. I missed a uh, one piece in one that I would like to go back to. It's the last sentence in one small uh, uh, Romanet one. Where it says the secretary identifies the federal agency and the other educational assistance funds provided at the agency in a notice published by the federal register. Um, you know, I think it should be appropriate for schools from a planning point of view that they should only be responsible for including in the 90 the federal education assistance funds that were identified in the federal register prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. It would be it would be unfair to schools to notify, to notify them halfway through the year or all the way at the end of their fiscal year and they had not planned accordingly that those funds were going to be part of the 90. So that, that's first a request and I can submit a language change for that. We'll, we'll um, take that back. If you want to provide language, you can go ahead and submit that. 
Thank you. And then on the second comment, um, during the, the 9010 public comments last year, a commenter specifically asked for the department to come prepared to the first session with a full list of funding sources it would consider federal education assistance funds. Can I ask why we don't have the list considering Congress passed this law months ago? And the department has had ample time to compile the list. As you know, this is important rulemaking with a potentially huge consensus and we and not having this list impairs us in these decisions. I'd like to have the, the list for the second session so I know what we need to be discussing in terms of what is and is not a federal fund. My response to that would be that there are two parts to that list, and I think in fairness to, in fairness to institutions, um, it, it's more than simply requiring a list. Remember that we that you still have to be. Um, each school would have to be um, provided with uh, data uh, about each individual student's award. And um, certainly you have that if the agency, as with Title IV funds, um, you draw down funds and you disperse those funds uh, for us so you know exactly what students received. That's not the case with all these benefits. So we don't we don't want to just provide a list of, of entities with whom there is no uh, uh, protocol for providing the school with a student with student level data. And I respectfully disagree with the assertion that we've had plenty of time to do that. We have been working on it. Um, we continue to work on it and um, we'll, we'll try to provide it at the earliest possible convenience. Thank you. It's just hard to negotiate on something when you don't know what's in and out. Oh, I understand those constraints. And, I, and as I said before, we're doing our best to get that uh, to get that uh, together and identify all these sources and think about what agreements we might we might uh, have. Okay, thank you, uh, Jalen, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so one thing, want to rewind back really, uh, Greg, you had mentioned that it was uh, when I talked about the institutional loans that it was that you guys are monitoring that and it's hard to really, you know, determine at that rate. But what I want to allude to is that, that we think that this is something that can be um, be handled right now. It really is our view that the regulations could, in fact, exacerbate the problem of predatory institutional lending. And the problem is a widespread that is ongoing and is illustrated by yesterday's CFPB's announcement related to these types of loans. Simply excluding annual payments from institutional loans could help with this problem, but we do have an opportunity to improve the landscape. Now, moving forward to this section that we're at right now, I see that we're using the term fiscal year, and I understand that you know the way the disbursements are allotted throughout the time frame that that may be fairly relative in a manner of being able to calculate everything. But what I would like to keep in mind here is the student um, and making sure that the student is at the forefront and not literally um, the institution is at the forefront. So in a way, that is there a measure that we can use that will keep that student in the forefront of the, dis of the disbursement? Uh, well, I mean, the reference to fiscal year is because that's the way 9010 is calculated. So. Um, what we were what we were discussing in the disbursement rule here is um, a specific mechanism used by I don't want to suggest all schools or even a majority of schools, but by some schools that 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 are that risk failing failing 9010 in a second year. They failed at the first year. If they fail the second year, that will render them ineligible. So because it's done on a cash basis, instead of um, dispersing funds and then requesting the funds immediately, they allow that fiscal year to elapse so that it's gone. So now they're going to draw those funds in the next fiscal year and they haven't failed title for they haven't failed eligibility because now they've passed 9010 in the second year because they didn't include those funds and they roll the request for those funds into the next year when the counting for 9010 begins again. So to that effect to that effect I think that this does protect students because it 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 uh, it closes a gaming loophole. Um right. associated with that. Again I I I wasn't and I don't didn't mean to suggest and saying that I don't think this rule exacerbates the problem with 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 uh, with um, private loans unless schools intentionally uh, uh, violate Title IV regulations. But I, I but I didn't mean to suggest there's nothing else the department could do about um, with respect to private loans or that we haven't considered any of those avenues. Just that that's that's not on the table here and wasn't germane to uh, 9010. Thank you. Certainly. I have Barmax hand up next. So uh, first of all, I want to express very strong support for the department's uh, disbursement rule because we are quite aware that, that for a long time, 
uh, some institutions have in fact manipulated their 90-10 calculation by gaming the timing of the uh, drawdowns and disbursement. So I think it's a sensible change. Um, I, I wanted to address uh, the question uh, of um, identifying the agency. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what your success will be in securing agreements with every agency. And I certainly understand that that is the that is the best practice and the fairest way to the institution is for the agency to directly notify the, the institution that federal funds were provided to one of its uh, enrolled students. But I don't want to let the school off the hook. If if those agreements uh, don't materialize and the school has other ways of ascertaining the fact, they should not be they should not be allowed to to take a position of sort of studied ignorance where I don't know and I don't want to know. At the very least, they ought to ask people, is it, are you making this payment from, from the receipts of any federal program? I think that's a simple enough thing to ask. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to get it 100%, but I don't want to create a loophole where the agencies don't provide the information and the school knowingly cashes checks that it could easily find out have in fact uh, federal sources. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Brad. Thank you, Barmack. It's, but it is tough to uh, do your job when uh, you don't know the rules. Um, second Romanette, drawdown of funds. We understand that the department does not want schools to, to defer drawdowns. And we agree that, that that is inappropriate to do with students, but this is really problematic. The department is suggesting that we have time to draw down disbursements, to make it a fiscal year. But what if my fiscal year ends in the last week of the semester? Or, I mean, sorry, in the first week of the semester. As you know, there are rules in place regarding how and when funds can be drawn and dispersed. And institutional protocols for ensuring compliance. It's not an easy process working at G5 to pull funds. So how do we know what is timely or intentional? This is an operational nightmare in practice. The department is suggesting that all these other requirements and protocols would be ignored each year, and schools would have said be directed to draw down and disperse right away. I don't understand how I could bring in all the federal aid for 6,500 students on a semester that starts two days before my fiscal year ends. And that's the way I read this. As written here, that the, the the rule doesn't make any doesn't account for that the timing you're discussing. I, I will I will reiterate again that uh, we feel this is a necessary rule to to uh, to stop um, very serious gaming practices that 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 are that are occurring out there. Um, I, I do understand how that could be difficult, uh, you know, for a lot of schools. Um, I do note that some schools apparently have enough time to um, figure out how to do this. Um, so and it's and it, as I said, it's a clear it's a clear uh, it's a clear attempt at gaming the, the 90-10 calculation. Uh, if you have if you have language you want to propose as far as putting parameters around um, disbursements that occur at the end of the fiscal year where students where payment period begins uh, uh, late, then um, you know, feel free to uh, provide us with that. Yeah, good. So Greg, I'm curious. Now I've heard the word gaming about four times. Do we have documentation or proof that people are gaming? I, I that that is I struggle to agree with that term. Um, I, I I will I, I would love the department to provide documentation. I guess I'll actually make a request for the document to pro provide documentation that gaming is occurring in the federal aid system today by when they pull down funds. We um, have we have uh, had uh, we have had um, re reviews um, regarding 9010 where that where that practice has been identified. I, I if if I can provide I don't know the extent to which I'm able to um, uh, offer uh, specific uh, a documentation where you know with respect to uh, to program reviews. I know that completed reviews can reports can be uh, requested under FOIA. Um, the extent to which I can provide data, I, I don't know, but I will certainly look into uh, providing the uh, table with what we have. What we what what, I, what we are allowed to to release, but I can say unequivocally that yes, we have identified the practice. It, it, it very clearly does uh, does take place 
and I and I and I, although um, you might disagree with my characterization characterization of it as gaming, I don't know any other way to describe what's being uh, addressed in this particular regulation. Look, there, yeah, I would say it's either compliant or not. Uh, gaming is not an appropriate word, in my opinion. In this, uh, I respectfully uh, uh, disagree, but I, I you do have um, I'm, you know you you have a valid opinion. I uh, the department's position that the, is that this is an example of gaming. Thank you, uh, Barmak, please. I will not name the institutions, Brad, but two very large publicly traded uh, institutions, household names, I'm sure. Uh, we have examples of ways in which they intentionally delay the, the drawdown and disbursement of aid to which the, the students are entitled. Uh, now, can I prove causality? I don't know that I can prove cause. I'm not solving trick problems here, but it sure looks like had they drawn the funds down in a more timely manner that they would have tripped the 90-10 wire. So, so I don't know, if, is that gaming? Is that manipulation? Is that, is that uh, compliance avoidance? I don't know what you want to call it, but it's a problem for the vets who end up enrolled at places that probably uh, were not ideal venues for them. Barmak, I'm curious, what's, what's your definition of timely? As long as uh, the institute, I, I am not unsympathetic to your concern. I don't know that your reading of the language is really fair to the department because the department is not suggesting that institutions ignore cash management rules or ignore the, the pre-existing disbursement rules that it has already meticulously documented. I think what the department is attempting to do is to say, look, if the student is entitled to the disbursement under existing other existing rules and regulations, you should not delay that uh, because that delay could be an, a, a, an attempt at circumventing this particular provision. OK, um, thank you for that uh, discussion. Um, Greg, I'm not seeing any hands up, and I wonder if now it might be an appropriate time to call for. I know we've been giving an afternoon break. Do, do you just want to walk us through briefly uh, point number three, and then what we'll do is we'll We'll have a 15 minute break and then just come back and resume discussion on that. Does that sound all right? That sounds good. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Aaron, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing up the document. Thank you, Aaron. We're looking at uh, uh, three revenue generated from programs and activities. Um, this language will clarify that uh, Revenue generated from the institution's programs, which is included in the 9010 calculation, includes only those that are related directly to services performed by students and necessary for the education and training of those students. Um, we uh, have proposed to clarify language related to revenue from funds paid by students to include only ineligible education or training programs that do not include any eligible coursework. The language also notes that revenue from those programs cannot be included unless it provided it is provided rather at an approved location of the institution that such revenue must not be from a program where the institution solely provides the facilities for test prep courses acts as a proctor or oversees a self-study course and that the program must be approved by the state and accredited and lead to an industry recognized credential so it, with that i'll walk through the language itself um, so in three, the institution must consider as revenue only those funds it generates from tuition fees, other institutional charges for students enrolled in eligible programs as defined in 668.8 or activities conducted by the institution that are necessary for the education and training of its students, provided those activities are A, conducted on campus or at a facility under the institution's control, B, performed under the supervision of a member of the institution's faculty, C, required to be performed by all students in a specified educational program at the institution. And here we have the addition of D, related directly to services performed by the institution. Um, and uh, finally, three, funds paid, uh, Romanet three rather, funds paid by the student or on behalf of a student by a party unrelated uh, to the institution its owners or affiliates 
for an education or training program that is not eligible under 668.8 and does not include any courses or coursework offered in an ineligible program, the non eligible education program or training must be provided by the institution at one of its approved locations. The institution may not count revenue from a non eligible education or training program where it merely provides facilities for test preparation, acts as a proctor or oversees a course of self study. Uh, be approved by a license um, by uh, or licensed by the appropriate state agency is accredited uh, by an accreditation agency recognized by an accrediting agency rather recognized by the secretary under 34 CFR parts uh, part 602. Or provides an industry uh, related uh, credential or certification. And we've uh, we've we've uh, tightened up that language somewhat there, as you can see. And that is everything uh, in three revenue generated from programs and activities. So uh, we'll pick up a discussion there when we come back from the break. Sounds good. And Jalen, I see your hand up, and Brad, I see your comment. So we'll pick up with Jalen and Brad once we come back. Um, but uh, it is 2:26. Let's say 2:40. Would that work for the committee? 14 minutes. That sounds good to me. All right, see everyone then. Thank you so much.
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the break. Um, we can jump right back into number three, revenue generated from programs and activities. Um, I had Jalen's hand up first um, before we went on break. So Jalen, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so real quick question. I see we the, the department has made some changes to the definition of industry recon, recognized credentials or certification. Um, my question is really, can you, we go a little bit more detailed in that definition uh, for one and then also we propose that the regulation include a reference to the certification requirement that was discussed this morning um, to reflect the requirement that ensures credentials are not just recognized by potential employers but accepted by them in practice as well. Okay um, yeah I could clarify that a little bit for you so these are um, again we're talking about um, starting under Roman at three funds paid by a student or on behalf of a party unrelated for an education program or training program that is not an eligible program. So we're not talking, this is a, this is a, uh, a statutory uh, a provision that Congress gave to count a revenue that's not an eligible program. So we have no, uh, yeah. we have no really, we have no jurisdiction over what, uh, what an eligible, pro non-eligible program does. So okay. it's not, doesn't really relate to what we were talking about earlier. Um, so we, the change that we made here, these are all the uh, stipulations for that, that it be provided by the institution, one of its approved locations. And then um, we went down through uh, the, the other requirements there. And, and then under what is now D, uh, provide used to be provides an industry recognized credential or certification or prepares students to take an examination and an industry recognized credential, uh, uh, recognized credential or certification issued by an independent third party. We've uh, we've uh, proposed to eliminate that to tighten this up so that the only type of program that would be uh, would fall under this would be one that actually provides a credential because we did not feel it was appropriate to include uh, just um, offering training for an examination or offering examination. So that's the that's why we took uh, we uh, took the action we did there with respect to that language. All right, thank you for that clarifies it for you. It does. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Brad. Go ahead. I'm, I'm good to let Ann go unless you want me to go. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so on the uh, non-Title IV program funding, um, the department's proposing that a school can't count funds from non-Title IV programs if the non-Title IV program includes any courses or coursework offered in an eligible program. This is usually problematic. Most schools are going to offer non-Title IV programs that have some relationship to their Title IV programs. They offer because that's what they qualify to teach. That's what they have teachers uh, employed to teach. So this would effectively preclude schools from counting the revenue from all these programs. Also, what is the policy justification for this restriction? Why, are, why is a school able to generate revenue from a non-Title IV program that's unrelated to my core programming and the mark of the quality of the institution while generating revenue from a non-Title IV program that is related to my core program that may be bad? The department also proposes that revenue from a non-Title IV program can only be counted if it's offered in an approved location. This is another huge issue as well. Lots of schools offer non-title programs on site for employers, other partners at facilities, or locations of the institution that are not approved by the department. It's worth reminding everyone that institutional locations only have to be approved by the department if they offer more than 50% of the Title IV program. There's nothing wrong or unusual about having locations that are not improved. And you would expect that if the primary purpose of a location is to facilitate non-Title IV training programs, there is also a good policy reason for this restriction. Again, why am, why am I able to generate revenue from a Title IV program offered at an approved location, good and mark of a good mark of the quality of institution while generating revenue from a non-Title IV program offered across the street at a non-approved location is bad. Many government agencies send their employees to for-profit training programs. Finally, the department eliminates several categories of non-Title IV programs that have been uh, around for many years. This basis for deletions is completely unclear. For example, I would be grateful if the department could explain why revenue generated from a non-Title IV program that provides an industry recognized credential or certification is good in the mark of, good, of a quality institution, while revenue generated from non-Title IV program that provides training needed for students to maintain state licensing is now bad. 
Uh, I'll let Steve uh, jump in if he wants to here, but first I'll just say that uh, this uh, again reflects uh, our, our concern about institutions, about of eligible institutions subject to 9010 um, entering into uh, arrangements whereby the school doesn't isn't really truly providing that 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 education or really it's not really a uh, a true training program um, and we uh, feel the need to uh, to 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 tighten that up we're not making any uh, assertions about whether a program is a good you know good or bad which seems what's where is it where is it appropriate to council revenue and i'll i'll uh, leave it to steve if he wants to add to that yeah i'll just add to that that for purposes of the title four program an institution is its is the sum of its main location and its approved additional locations. And that's why we're only going to propose to count revenue from programs offered at those locations because that is the institution as far as the the Title IV programs are concerned. It's it it's to bring parity with the definition of the institution and the sources of the revenue. So then a non title four program taught in an approved location is now OK. Only if it meets the other requirements in these regulations for purposes of counting the revenue in the 9010. OK, we'll, we'll submit you. comments on, on that. Yeah, OK, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Ian, go ahead. Sure, and so I'm this is just I think a straightforward clarification question and so in Romanet 2D and Greg, when you read this you even read it differently than what's written because it says related directly to services performed by students is is that really services performed by students or are you talking about by institutions or for students no, we're talking about related directly to services provided uh, performed by students. An example of that would be um, uh, uh, frequently, if I can use a cosmetology example, uh, cosmetology programs have, have clinics uh, in which students work and people can go to uh, to get um, uh, you know their hair done there and um, the students and, and, and the school can count the revenue from that. That's 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 permissible for statute. Uh, but we are concerned that that revenue only be those services relate directly related to the services performed by the student. In other words, in this example I gave, the uh, the um, the revenue derived from the uh, from the uh, cosmetology service or haircut or something like that or coloring or whatever is being done. Um, and and specifically that we uh, do not uh, allow the uh, sale of products to be counted as revenue. Um, we have. Uh, had policy to that effect um, for some time that uh, but we are now codifying that it has to be actually a service performed by the institute by the student and cannot be ancillary in other words the whole idea here is is, is this was set up because obviously uh and, and, and to use my example of cosmetology it's necessary for students to practice uh, that skill to become a licensed cosmetologist that's what we're saying here uh activity Activities conducted by the institution necessary for the education and training of its students. So, an example I gave that was just a very easy one, um, where I where I made a delineation between what would be allowable the uh, the revenue for the actual uh, haircut and what would not be allowable. The student sells a certain amount of product. That's that's, uh, that's probably a pretty easy one, but I think one that serves the purpose here. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Barmack, please. I just want to say that we strongly support the department's uh, restrictions on uh, non eligible programs. I want to remind people. You know, don't count a gift horse in the mouth is is the proverb. No, the purpose of 9010 was to test the market viability of programs being funded with federal dollars. The fact that Congress decided in its wisdom to allow institutions to count completely unrelated programs they may be offering is a gift that you should accept without pushing your luck too much because it seems to me that it's, it's very difficult to argue that those revenues, no matter what they are, have it provide any indication of the market. It's not a matter of quality, Brad. It's a matter of market viability. 
is anybody else except the federal government willing to reach into their pocket to put a dime on the dollar into this program? The fact that non-eligible programs under any set of restrictions count is a freebie. I wouldn't push it too far. I think what the department is doing here is quite reasonable. Uh, Brad. Thank you. Thank you, Barmac. Uh, you know, I'll just give you an, an easy example here just for the committee to think about. So we have an accounting program that has a Becker course within that program. and We offer that pro that course to someone outside of our institution, a non-student, already teaching the course. I read that as that not included. Another example is CPR course is required for nursing school. We offer a CPR course to the public as part of the students can attend. Is the public portion not included? So, so again, these are not things that are being taught by students. Yeah, we have a dental clinic that are taught by students. I get that piece. There are other fundamental things um, that I, I would disagree with when saying completely different from the institution. And so that's where I think we need better definitions. Okay, thank you. Um, Greg, do you want to walk us through section four? I'm not seeing any other hands for three. So application of funds, if the department's ready. Sure, we can okay. do that. Um, application of funds. Uh, you can see here again that we have uh, revised Title IV funds to instead uh, read federal funds. So just as a, an overview here, um, the institution must presume that federal funds it disperses or delivers to on to or on behalf of a student will be used to pay tuition fees or institutional charges, regardless of whether the institution credits the funds to the student's account or pays the student or pays the funds directly to the student, except to the extent that the student's tuition fees or other charges are satisfied by grant funds provided by non-federal agencies, provided that those funds do not include federal or institutional funds. And we've added we've added that there where this is existing language where it's uh, uh, provided by non federal public agencies. Just want to make it clear here that that does not as long as those funds do not include um, federal or institutional funds and uh, private sources unrelated to the institution, its owners or its affiliates. The changes here provide some technical clarification uh, related to grant funds provided by non federal agencies. Excuse me, or private entities. Under these revisions, federal funds are applied to the student's tuition fees or institutional charges, except where those charges are covered by non federal public grant dollars that do not include federal institu or institutional funds, private grants from an entity unrelated to the institution, under a contractual arrangement between the institution and a state, federal, or local agency to provide job training, funds from educational savings. Uh, funds eligible for IRS benefits, 529 plans, institutional scholarships that meet other uh, requirements. So I'll stop there and entertain comments. All right, comments or questions for the department? Yes, and anyone? I actually had a question for the department. Um, I didn't see it in this issue paper, but has the department thought about adding a definition in section 668.2a at the end to define federal funds. I know here in this language they will be defined in the federal register or something like that. at least the agencies that would be held liable under this new 9010 would be in the federal register whenever the federal register would come out. But I was curious as if a definition would be applied in regulation. Since the statute that this comes from uses the term federal education assistance program, um, I just was curious. Well, I, you know, we we probably could provide a definition, but I think that definition would largely just, you know, mirror what's you know what's in statute. Um, we we at the beginning here uh, talk about um, uh, uh, federal education assistance funds, and I think to offer a uh, uh, to offer a complete and holistic um, definition would require listing every every source. I'm not sure how we would do it other than to say that federal and emanating from the federal government and uh, federal education assistance. I think that that's a pretty broad uh, that's, that's that paints with a pretty broad brush as it is. The uh, the register is simply to 
um, inform schools of where we have identified those sources going directly to students and, and have developed a protocol for schools to be informed of that. Um, so I'm not, I mean, if you have something you want to propose, I don't, I, I think that the, that we would like to keep it broad because it does include uh, all federal uh, education assistance funds and that there's no, I don't perceive a need to narrow that in any way. So I, I would entertain text if someone has it. Um, as, as it is, I would suggest that it's fairly self-explaining um, the, the way it's uh, written currently. Uh, Brad, go ahead. The department here is uh, an application of funds is proposing that any funds received from a non federal public agency that includes some federal funds should be included. Note the word some. Does that mean if federal has a state matching component, for example, what if the split was 25% federal, 75% state, that all of the state funds associated in those dollars would count towards the 90? That's just wrong. Year up program that is run by the department comes to mind. Many states participate in this program and are required to use state funds to participate to provide scholarships to these students. Are the state funds going to be deemed federal education benefits for the purposes of this program? Got a second question after you respond. Um, we did have discussions about this. I don't think that uh, this regulation is, is maybe doesn't reflect all of that. I it is. Um, it is not our intention to uh, call state funds federal funds, but on the other hand, we uh, uh, would not allow the inclusion of uh, anything in a state grant that that included federal the, the portion that was federal funds. Um, we we certainly could will consider if there needs to be other, uh, more language here about um, uh, to the extent this, the institution is able to to break down what uh, portion of that grant is. Is, is federal and state. In some cases, it's not possible to do that. That information is not provided. Uh, we were aware of that. Um, Steve, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, thanks, Greg. I think it's an area where we would welcome suggestions, and including a suggestion that if there was a way to, to allocate the, the funds between the federal and the non-federal sources, that that be considered. It's a uh, it's a question of whether it's administratively feasible and ascertainable. But certainly if we went in that direction and had language uh, to that effect, it would be incumbent upon the institution to be able to, to demonstrate how they uh, perform that calculation and that uh, no federal funds were included. Okay, so second question here, um, the Department of Labor works with states in running a Workforce Initiative and Opportunity Act uh, called WIA. The Labor Department works with states to implement this program and provides states with funding to help students enroll in vocational programs. The state manages the programs and actually distri distributes the funds to students, not the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor suggesting that all WIA funds now be included as federal education assistance funds. We do um, uh, note that the changes uh, that provided um, Changes uh, related to grant funds provided by non-federal agencies are applied first. To, uh, under these revisions, federal funds are applied first, uh, uh, except where those charges are covered by uh, non-federal grant dollars, private grants, uh, and under contractual agreements between the institution and and federal local government agencies to provide uh, job training for low-income individuals. And all that's uh, those are still considered to be. We didn't make any changes to funds uh, provided first. Correct, Steve. I think that's right. I, I just think there's a strong argument that we a contract fund should not apply under paragraph four Romanet two, which exempts funds from federal, state or local governments to provide job training to low income individuals in need of that training. That's exactly what WIA does when the state contracts with an institution to provide that training. I'd like the department to consider specifically naming these funds as exempt and under Romanet two. We will take that. We will take that back. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Thank you, uh, Johnson, please. Yeah, I just want to uh, go to um, paragraph four, Romanet one. I just applaud the um, the department for including this language so that the uh, the educational institution can't essentially make up that uh, 
a private contribution by either through a foundation or uh, some other mechanism that, that makes it look like the uh, um, the private market is actually motivating people to go to the school. So I think this is great language here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barmack. I want to support Brad's point about commingling of some federal dollars, essentially turning the entire pot of money into uh, into federal money. Uh, you could address that in four Romanet one A by simply so at least to 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 address his issue. You could cover that by saying then the non federal portion of you know, grants provided by non-federal public agencies. Now, whether how it can be ascertained is a different pra pragmatic issue, but at the very least, let's clarify very explicitly that where there is federal money um, involved in a state uh, grant or scholarship program, the state portion certainly should not count as federal funding. Um, point taken. We're we're definitely going to take back that uh, that. Um that 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 uh, those points and um, consider them in, in future language. And Dave, I see your hand and I just want to note that Ashley is joining us on behalf of minority serving institutions. So welcome Ashley, but Dave, please take it away. Yeah, thanks Brady. I think this ties to Barmack's comments and some others that people made just to, as an auditor, the need to clarify some of these regulations. Um, they're not specifically identifying types of funds or we're talking about non cash basis revenue in order to audit and attest to the accuracy of a calculation. We would need a lot more specific guidance on when do funds become eligible if they haven't been drawn down as written. I don't think it would be possible to perform that task. Uh, Dave, if you have a uh, suggestion, uh, um, no, um, I think in your role as advisor, if you have uh, suggestions you think might accomplish uh, that goal um, or to help implement the reg, we'd be amenable to receiving them. I would be happy to work with you on that. Great. Uh, Barmack. Um, I have a question for Dave. Wouldn't that be a matter of a compliance audit before you're doing a financial audit? In other words, wouldn't you test to make sure the institution is in fact complying with the requirement that it draw down and disperse funds in a timely fashion? If it does, it becomes auditable. If it doesn't, that's a compliance issue. Uh, I, mean, I guess partially, but I'm not sure it's written clearly enough to determine whether or not it was done timely. And it, um, I would say I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I have not seen the timing in some of the terms with schools that we've worked with. That doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Um, you know, processing financial aid with verifications and lots of changes. There's there's timing difference of when funds are drawn drawn down um, in order to determine if it was done timely. Um, I don't know. I guess hopefully accounts are too black and white. I need to know specifically. OK, what are the criteria that make it qualify as it should have been drawn down more clearly. Can I just follow up? This is an important point. Wouldn't I'm not an auditor, don't know anything about this stuff, but my assumption is that you don't have to test every transaction. My assumption is you would test those transactions that that sort of sit proximate to a to a um, to the end of a fiscal year. My assumption is that to whatever extent you're attempting to catch gaming, you would do so in d during time periods when it could make a difference to this particular calculation, right? I mean, a delay in drawing down funds from January, if, if, if you're doing a calendar year audit, wouldn't make a difference. But if you're looking at November, December, that could make a difference. It, it could. I guess the eligibility is determined on a student by student basis and there are oftentimes drawdowns, including large rosters of students. And depending on um, the, the delivery method of educational programs, not every student on a roster might be following the same thing. It's based on when they become eligible for the drawdown. So it would still take digging into a roster of a drawdown and then looking at individual students, applying whatever the guidance is to determine when was this student's eligible to be drawn down. 
I, I would just specify, um, I think you're using the term loosely, I get it, just compliance audit. So to me, the client is often a Title IV reviewing the financial aid processing, and 9010 is actually part of the financial statement audit and process, but the purpose is the same. Yeah, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't want to make light of the discussion here because I find it very interesting. And as a, as a uh, 90 10 warrior from way back, I, I, I do enjoy the discourse. Uh, and, and the end, I think we've made uh, the points here. In the interest of getting through 90 10, we're now at uh, six minutes after three. We have a hard stop for, um, for public comments. So, uh, yeah, as I said before, the department's willing to take any comments related to this, uh, suggestions as to how we can do it, uh, how we can do it better. Um, and I think at this point, we're going to need to move on to. Uh, to five, if that's okay. All right, uh, so we are at uh, five revenue generated from institutional aid, and I know we made a, a slight change there. Uh, the institution may include the following uh, institutional aid as revenue. For loans made to a student and credited in full to the student's uh, account at the institution. Um, just reiterating what these are, bona fide as evidenced by standalone repayment agreements issued at intervals related to the student institution's enrollment periods subject to regular loan repayments and collections by the institution and are separate from enrollment contracts. So this, this remains the same. Uh, we have eliminated uh, language that is no longer relevant um, to uh, uh, Loans made on or after July 1, 2008, but uh, before July 1, 2012. So um, that was not, that's no longer relevant, so it's been removed. Um, if we move down, um, again, we've removed the relevant language related to loans between specific periods, which have now, uh, which have now elapsed. Um, and so let's move down to uh, uh, Romanet, uh, I believe that's four. Uh, no, Roman at, uh, Roman at two. For scholarships provided by the institution in the form of monetary aid, um, the amount dispersed to students during the fiscal year. The scholarship must be dispersed from an established restricted account and may be included as revenue only to the extent that the funds in that account represent designated funds from an outside source that is unrelated to the institution, its owners or affiliate or income earned on those funds. So what we are doing here is proposing to eliminate tuition discounts from the types of scholarships provided by the institution because uh, tuition discounts are not uh, are generally not ex associated with a cash transaction. And stop there and entertain any comments on five before we move on to six. Any questions or comments for the department? Jalen. All right, thank you. Um, so yes, certainly want to, this goes back to our topic earlier on that we were discussing, Greg, I'm worried about the closing, closing the GI Bill loophole, but leaving room for the count, counting of institutional loan revenue on the 10 side um, will simply create a new loophole to, related to private student loans, and excuse me, this goes to numerate I, um, number one, excuse me, underneath this section. And then also the draft language is an improvement on current regulations, but the loan repayments do not reflect a willingness on the part of students to pay cash for a portion of their program, especially because schools sometimes use aggressive debt collection tactics such as transcript withholding. As I mentioned earlier yesterday, the CFPB announced that the new work that they were doing to crack down on these types of unscrupulous institutional lending practices um, we believe that this will encourage predatory schools to push students into private loans and then strong arm them into repayment using aggressive debt collection tactics. Additionally, we would like to see language excluding, excluding not only annual payments from institutional loans, but also from loans issued by owners and or affiliates, similar to the language that we see elsewhere in the proposed uh, regulations. OK, we'll take that back. I think, you know, when we look at institutional loans, first of all, I, I, the department's very concerned about a misuse of institutional loans, private loans and, and, and private loans in general. I, I do want to say that it, we do not think that all institutional loans are bad. Um, they, they, they are sometimes a necessary uh, means of, of, of funding. Uh, this, this 
table, we're only concerned with uh, with 9010, um, not the regulation of, of, of institutional loans. We're, talk, we're talking about what portion of those the institution can count towards its 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 non non federal revenue, and we currently restrict it to the uh, only the amount repaid on those loans. So there is already a fairly uh, strict um, uh, reporting set up there. Um, as far as like the loan, those loans not indicating a student's willingness to pay for their education, I could see that point of view. However, uh, you would have to make the same argument with respect to Title IV loans. Then that you know that that too would be uh, indicative of an, of, an, of a student's unwillingness to pay uh, for the education. Um, Ninety ten isn't about a student's willingness to pay for the entire education in cash. It's about are people willing to pay for some portion of it. So. I, I I think what we have indicates that, but we'll certainly take those considerations and uh, take those uh, concerns under consideration. Absolutely, that, I think that's really all we ask is that you can really just go back and look at this um, and look at from that perspective as well, because then that way we are, as I've been putting forth, putting the student at the forefront of this um, and sending them as our focal point, but also we want to make sure that we're not opening up a, another can of worms by opening up more loopholes that will ultimately add more um, terrible predatory lending practices that we, that we like to call it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did, Kearney, I saw your hand up, but is, do you still want to speak or has your question been answered? No, it was addressed. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Not seeing anything additional on five revenue generated from institutional aid. Do you want to go over the, del the deletion of six or do you want to jump into the number six, the funds excluded from revenues? Uh, there's not much to say about six because again, it's deleted because of uh, the, we no longer have uh, uh, to worry about uh, uh, ECASLA with respect to loans that were um, uh, un under the FFL direct loan program on or after July 1, 2008, but before 2000, July 1, 2011, that's faded well into the past, so we're not uh, too concerned with that. Gotcha. Do you want to jump right to the new I'm number six? I'm going to jump right to six, if it's okay. Yep. Um, so uh, six is funds excluded from revenues. And let's take a look at that. For the fiscal year, the institution does not include the amount of federal work study wages paid directly to the student. However, the institution, if the institution credits the student's account with FWS funds, those funds are included in revenue. That is not a change. The amount of funds received by the institution from a state under the uh, LEAP, SLEEP, or GAP programs, again, that hasn't changed. The amount of institutional funds used to match uh, Title IV HEA program funds. And um, again, here we have uh, the amount of Title IV HEA funds related to refunded to students or returned to the secretary. And we don't have to worry about uh, ECASLA uh, again because that's um, that is um, uh, that time frame is no longer relevant. Um, the amount of the student, the amount the students charge for book supplies, equipment, unless the institution includes that amount as books uh, as, as tuition fees or other institutional charges or any amount from the proceeds of uh, the factoring or, or the factoring or sale of accounts uh, receivable uh, or institutional loans, regardless of whether the loans were sold without recourse. So um, we uh, are, this is an addition here under Romanet 6. We propose to clarify that an institution may not include funds received from the factoring or sale of accounts receivable or institutional loans. Revenue that results from the sale of, of receivables is not derived from tuition fees or other institutional charges for students enrolled in programs eligible for federal education assistance and does not indicate a willingness on the part of students to pay cash for a portion of their program, as is the intent of um, um, which is which is the, is the intent of of uh, 9010. And so that ends a so I'll stop there and, and open the floor for comment. Thank you, Greg and Aaron Barmack, you are first. So two questions. One of them has to do with the new uh, six um, Romanet two. The reason you are only citing uh, matching funds for Title Four is because you already dis you already uh, exclude all tuition discounts in any matching arrangements. Am I right about that? 
In other words, tuition discounts are not real cash flows, so they don't count under any circumstances. Correct, but we this this is not remember this is not um, the uh, the funds the, the amount of institutional funds used to match uh, Title IV HEA program funds. Uh, this is just saying that it cannot be uh, that those are funds excluded uh, from revenues, and that's that's not that's not new. That's that's existing. It's always been the case. No, I'm I'm curious about the reason I'm asking the question. The only ones that I can think of right off the top of my head are like campus based, you know, work study matching funds, for example. That's real money. You're you're excluding that, but I just want to make sure. For example, yellow ribbon program, where the institution does derive additional uh, revenue from the VA in exchange for a matching discount. The discount doesn't count as part of the 10 percent because tuition discounts are not cash flows. Am I correct about that? Yes, we're not counting in. We're not we're not. We propose not to count any disc, any any disc. OK, perfect. Right. OK, then you're right. The, the only ones, the only matches I can think of, Carmack, uh, currently that I'm aware of are, are the campus based are the campus based matches, which uh, well, which would be uh, which would normally be well, could be cash. Got it. Second question having to do with Roman at six. Uh, this has been looming in the back of my mind and I just don't know the answer, so I'm asking. What do you do with private label third party loans when there is an origination or business arrangement or credit enhancement uh, involving the school? Do you treat those as institutional loans? We. We. Uh, well, if. If it's by a, uh, a related uh, a related party, I, and I'll, I'll get Steve to, to weigh in this, that would be kind of the same as institutional loans. If it's from a uh, if it's from an entity where there is a uh, a recourse associated with the loan, such that if the student doesn't pay back the loan, um, the institution has to uh, um, pay recourse to the lender or wh wherever that lender is, right. then we require that though the institution may count as revenue, the uh, uh, the loan, uh, it must also uh, subtract as revenue any amount that's paid as a matter of recourse. And I'll turn it over to Steve if he wants to elaborate. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. It's, that is well, the way I it do. Works. That's a real problem because remember, the revenues could be booked in a given fiscal year with the recourse coming due years later. ITT comes to mind. Uh, you know, it seems to me that you, you somewhere in this regulation, you absolutely need to clarify that that third party loans made by another entity with which the institution has either an origination or a business relationship or any kind of a recourse or credit enhancement arrangement will be treated as institutional loans because otherwise you, you kind of undo the whole cash basis uh, analysis, you know, the, the lump sum of money seems to come in, but it's a ghost transaction because two years out, a lump sum of money would go out. Thank you, Barmak. I just want to know, um, so Johnson and Jalen, I see your hands, but Brad in the chat did say he would address Barmak's question. So if you're all right, is it okay if we jump to, to Brad? Okay, yeah, Brad, go ahead. I, I've got a, a longer winded answer that I'll address his question in, so I, I'll just wait my turn. Sounds good. All right, All right Johnson, go ahead. Uh, thanks. You know, I just wanted to um, support the uh, Roman at six. I represented uh, clients who've been sued on institutional debt who's been sold to uh, uh, debt buyers, it's very attractive. I mean, it's just prospecting basically. It, it, there's no guarantee of return. It doesn't have a lot of street value, but it, it definitely happens. Uh, and so to count those revenues, um, it just seems speculation. So I appreciate that. All right, thank you. Uh, Jalen, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to sort of go back to what Barmack was speaking on. I think we are happy to see that the sale of receivables such as institutional loans will not count as revenue, um, but it is important to reiterate, however, that this provision effectiveness is negated by allowing schools to count institutional loans as revenue. Additionally, the term institutional loans should be clarified into 
to also include owners and affiliates as well. Thank you. I, I do want to clarify, and maybe everybody already knows, is that with institutional loans, we only they can only count the amount that's repaid on those loans. So if they're so if if an institution is giving students loans that it never they have to be true loan instruments, uh, you know, with, with expectation of repayment and promissory note. And um, so if it's only the extent to which they repay, which 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 uh, which forces them to be true loans. But uh, you're suggesting that we uh, disallow revenue from any institutional loans. OK, yeah, correct. So I think what we really would like to do is that and just specify um, that language a little bit, adding in the owners or affiliates to it. OK, thank you. We'll take that back. Hey, thank you, Brett. Go ahead. Hey, <clears throat> this may be my favorite discussion point on 9010. My last plan comment, and it is around number six here. Wish I had a whiteboard. I can teach my accounting class virtually here. So how does an account receivable or an institutional loan end up on the balance sheet? Pretty simple. You debit accounts receivable or loan receivable and you credit tuition and fee revenue. How can the department propose that this fund source be excluded when the cash is directly associated with the tuition revenue? So how can you count the revenue in the denominator but exclude the cash from the AR in the numerator? This goes against a basic clear accounting matching principle. Also, the AR and institutional loans are clearly not a federal source. Why are institutional loans that pay during the year any different? Cash is cash. Let me let me give a little insight to this committee because I'm not sure people understand why an institution might want to sell an institutional loan. It may not be why you think. It may not be to hit the tin. But that's not what I've seen. As part of Basic gap accounting, when a receivable or loan is put on the books, a corresponding reserve for bad debt is put. You may not realize this, but that bad debt expense is not a tax eligible expense until it's realized. That means the loan has to come off the books to be used against your taxes. Loans with recourse do not come off your books and do not count as a tax eligible expense. So that is an important difference. But loans that are sold without recourse are. Many proprietary schools sell AR and loans in order to offset their federal tax exposure, which is a completely legal thing to do with the, via the IRS. The department asking all schools to now pay more in taxes than they normally would have by excluding this provision? Maybe we need to loop in the IRS and ask him that question. I firmly believe that institutions should focus on what they do best, which is providing a quality education to students. Servicing of loans is better left off to businesses that do that for a living. Thank you. I would respond that um, first of all, you know, going back to the spirit of the spirit of 9010 um, is that the uh, there's a willingness on the part of students to pay at least some cash for a portion of their program, not, not the entire idea of the program, but some cash for that. Um, with you know the difference between the loan, uh, the institutional loan, and um, and the and the uh, sale of the receivable is uh, there is a direct relationship between the loan and the student paying tuition and fees in as much as the student borrows the loan um, to pay for expenses at the institution. That's that's certainly the way it works with with title four loans and and with inst and with other types of loans. Uh, the sale of a receivable is a secondary source of of, of revenue that is just. Um, you know, I, and I, I'm not. I'm not saying that there might I have not we're not suggesting that there might not be legitimate reasons why a, a school might want to sell uh, receivables, but but in many cases uh, these receivables represent uh, bad debt that the institution has very little uh, hope of ever recovering as real as real revenue. So they, they'll they wind up selling it for minimal amounts on the dollar and um, in some cases, just to and, and, and I will agree with you that not in every case it's just done to gain 9010 or to cover 9010. But in this, but it I wouldn't call it gaming because currently it's it's allowable. But um, but um, uh, we certainly see the practice. And what we're trying to get at here is that that 10 percent indicates uh, or relates to a willingness on the part of students to to pay for a portion of their education. I don't know if Steve has anything to add, but I'll give him an opportunity. 
I don't have anything to add. I mean, it's the point is when the accounts receivable are sold, and it's not just institutional loans, it's it's accounts receivable as well. Um, the person purchasing those to try to make collections on them is not paying the institution for the classes that were provided for that for those uh, dollars. And that's why it doesn't it would not count for 9010 under this proposal. Steve, may I respond? Yeah, so uh, my question is then why is the revenue counting? The, the receivable was put on the books because there was a associated revenue. So if you're going to count the revenue. Why as long as the institution. Cash? Sorry, as long as the institution is collecting those payments from the people that took those classes from the students, it does count. It doesn't count as soon as those things are sold to an outside party. Because that outside party is not paying for the education. So, so Steve, I, I want to say this was a proposed change. So. Again, that is the way it works today. But there's two things that Greg said I, I want to comment on. He said number one that the receivable when sold was not tied to the revenue. That is not accurate. Uh, number two, he said they get minimal dollars returned um, on the receivables. That's not true in all instances. Um, and so I'm not sure what data you have on that, but uh, that's not an accurate statement. But I, I'll, I'll move on on this, but revenue and cash, if you're going to count it on one side, you got to count it on the other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sam, go ahead. Hi, um, this is more of a question, and I'm wondering if the department has put any thought into how students will be assisted if um, schools lose eligibility in 9010. How do we, how, how would the department step in and protect students in that case? And should we be adding something here um, to address that? Um, if a school closed, uh, if a school ceased to offer instruction as a result of the uh, um, and became ineligible as a result of two years of failure in 9010, um, students would be eligible for the same um, benefits that they would get in any case where where an institution would lose eligibility. And I, I understand the point. You know, I think it's a, it's it's always a very it's a very uh, a difficult situation because you know what we're involved in here is in any time that a, a regulatory uh, requirement or you know automatically results in that such as what would happen here with failure of 9010 or where the department takes action against the school it, it does unfortunately uh, you know put students in a situation where you know the the the, the, the school that they're going to is uh, is no longer offering instruction we don't have anything specific to um, students where an institution loses eligibility for 9010 due to 9010. I will say that it has happened fairly infrequently over the past at least since 9010 went into it, since 8515 became 9010. There have been very few instances. I, I don't know the exact number, maybe Steve does, but so far under the existing rules, there have not been a lot of institutions actually lose eligibility as a result of 9010, so there's not much precedent for it. Okay, thank you, uh, Barman. I, I, I want to support the inclusion of this language and respond to Brad a little bit. Brad, the problem with this notion of including sale of uh, receivables is that the institution would then be double dipping under the rules. You can't have the net present value of the receivable booked as revenue at the same time as you get to count all the cash receipts from previous cohorts of uh, um, borrowers that you may be collecting on. So, you know, if we're going to go to a cash basis of accounting, you're going to have to 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 limit the extent to which institutions institutions can receive lump sum net present value um, receipts for future receivables that should be booked because they're all commingled now together, cohort after cohort. Uh, you know, I understand the unfairness. Mm, you know, an alternative would be to allow the sale of receivables and then exclude previous cohorts, but you can't have both. You can't count all the previous payments and the net present value of the, of the loans you happen to sell in a lump sum uh, transaction. 
<laughs> Thank you, Marmac. Uh, Johnson, I see you, but I just want to welcome Kelly back to the table on behalf of private nonprofit institutions. But Johnson, go ahead. I'll try to make this quick, but I've seen it with my clients. The uh, you know, 9010 is premised on the idea that people are putting their own money, their own skin into the game. When you stop making your payments on your promissory note, it's usually because you don't feel like there was any value in what you got and you feel like you're ripped off. And that's why those payments, when they continue, show that people really do think they're getting something of value and they keep doing it. So when it just turns into a debt that can't be collected and sold on the market, I, I don't think that's a, 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 a reflects what the purpose of 9010 is, is to try to measure people putting skin in the game. Uh, Brad, I see your hand in your comment, but is it okay if, if Dave weighs in very briefly? Okay, yeah, Dave, go ahead. And um, Greg or Steve, I might need your assistance just to clarify, I think something to what Barmack said. So there was a period of time when in schools could use a net present value of loans and count that net present value for their 9010 calculation. Um, but I think that was ended five or six years ago, I think was the time. I just want to make sure I'm, that I'm understanding it correctly. So the, it's stricken from the from the issue paper, but that's because it's so long ago that nobody has those those loans aren't left. Is that? Yeah, that's correct. Right? Dave. OK. Uh, Brett, still feel free to comment if you like that. It'd be great. Um, before I do, since this will be my last comment, I just want to thank the department for the job they did this week. I think they've done an amazing job and uh, keeping us on track to get through all these issues possibly early, I think is an amazing task. So thank you all. Um, and just to address Barmack's question or comment, if you wait 10 years on your portfolio and sell it all at once, I, I understand your point there, sir. But if you are uh, dissolving your, your loan and receivable portfolio annually, it actually matches better to the revenues booked in that year um, from a matching principal perspective. So I think you can see both sides of that, where if you're doing it frequently, it actually works well in, in terms of the catch, cash matching the revenue. Okay. Um, Greg, I'm not seeing any other hands. Is there anything else the committee would like to add on section six otherwise greg i'll have you tee up um what what you'd like to temperature check oh barmac sorry i see your hand spoke way too soon i just want to i just want to remind the department that they they really need to add language on third party private label loans here without it all of this is meaningless because you're essentially creating another mechanism for potential gaming Sorry, Barmak, you said third third party related related loan related loans. Yeah, th okay. th third party private label loans where there is an origination business relationship or other form of credit enhancement arrangement with the institution. Those ought somewhere you ought to declare that those will be treated the same way as institutional loans. OK, thank because, you. Because, you know, my unemployed cousin Vinny may be available to make loans, right? I mean, you know, and. If he, if he is, I might need some money. I mean, you might want to. Uh, I mean, well, well, he's not going to strong arm me too much when I don't pay. Temperature check. Um, happy to like to break down. I know there was a comment a bit earlier about how how folks might want to break this up, but, but I'll defer to the department on what's most helpful. Well, this, we we had a lot in section. We just covered all of A, which is pretty much what, what we what we covered so far. I did we did break the discussion up into uh, various uh, uh, sub uh, paragraphs because I want because it was you know there was a lot there so we can take a temperature check on uh, all we've covered uh, through A because B is uh, reserved so we're not gonna do that and C is sanctions and won't take but you know uh, actually before we do that let me just go we might as well just do it all holistically because or as one in one group because all we have left are sanctions and um, there's not much there. So just let me cover sanctions briefly and um, then we'll go for a temperature check and we can do it on the entirety of the uh, of the of the paper uh, of what's in 668 
Uh, sanctions is in C, and um, just uh, we have not changed much here. You can see if an institution does not derive at least 10% of its revenue from sources uh, uh, other than federal funds, so we've uh, recognizing the statutory change. I'm not going to read all the language there because it is uh, it is not changed. Um, we added uh, we added four under C, uh, which says it is liable for any Title IV program funds it disperses after the fiscal year. It becomes ineligible to participate in the Title IV HEA program under C1 of this section. Exclude, excluding any funds the institution was eligible to disperse under 668.26. 668.26 is the are the regulations that uh, apply to the end of a program's uh, of an institution's participation in the in the Title IV programs rather. So this is uh, just codifying uh, current practice and, and clarifying it in the regulations. So um, I don't think we need if we need to discuss that point, we can certainly do that. But other than that, I would move for a temperature check. I do see at least one hand, Greg, if it's, if it's we can we have uh, let's see with 337. I think we have time to entertain. Yeah, that. we do have we do have a little bit of time, but but Carney, please take us away. Yeah, I just wanted kind of clarification about the two consecutive fiscal years. I know we addressed fiscal years earlier, um, but I'm, I'm concerned that like I don't know when it kicks in that they're not deriving at least 10 percent because my concern would be if the semester, you know, fall semester kicks off the school year in mid October. Is that not a full consecutive year then? So they might basically have a third additional year to um, be out of compliance before uh, they start seeing sanctions. Uh, no, they, 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 it's it's driven by fiscal year because it's it's um, uh, the ninety ten um, the uh, and and then um, I'm going to ask Dave to step in and correct me if I'm not getting this right. But but the the the, the auditor uh, puts it on uh, as a footnote to the um, uh, financial statements if the uh, institution has failed ninety ten. Uh, but the institution is required to notify us within forty five days irrespective of that, but the audits uh, uh, and and the um, it, it's all key to the to the to the institution's fiscal year here. So in other words, to answer your question, um, it doesn't make if, if there's a it's it's by fiscal year, not not when um, semesters occur or, or terms occur. So no, there'd be no way for, to extend it to an additional fiscal year. But I just want I'll ask Dave comment about exactly what the auditors do with respect to uh, a 90 10 termination. Um, well, I guess unfortunately I can't talk about that because I worked with a school that had a 90-10 termination, but just to, it would be, it's limited, it is limited to a two-year period. So most companies have a 12-31 fiscal year. Um, and so I think as written, it talks about uh, beginning January 1st, 2023. So it would be two years at the end of that two-year period. It doesn't, it's, it's, uh, it would be irregardless of terms that were in process or anything else at the end of that fiscal year that would end the two year period. Does that make sense, Kern? You're saying 24 consecutive months of not deriving 90% and they're looking at sanctions or do they have to wait until the following like fiscal year ends? The, I can answer this, you can't, Greg. So after, yeah, not, not sure you, what you, mean, you only no. measure it annually. So yeah, right. after the first year you would be evaluated, did you get more than 10% or not? If the answer is no, then as currently written, you would start the second year. And if the at the end of that second year, you also did not derive at least ten percent. Okay. At that point, you would you would fail. Yeah, Dave's absolutely correct. It's two two distinct fiscal years. So I would you don't you don't view the period to list as twenty four months. View it as one fiscal year. There's either a pass or a fail. Second fiscal year, pass or a fail. So two failures uh, would would mean a uh, loss of eligibility. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Oh, also, I just was curious. Um, the secretary has to be notified um, if they don't meet the fiscal year, but are there requirements to notify the students that are affected, you know, specifically people using a GI Bill or anything like that? I, I don't know that we have specific requirements related to 9010, but I see Steve has his hand up, so I'll defer to Steve. Well, so when you fail, when an institution fails 90-10 for two consecutive years, it loses eligibility um, with the very next day, right? So there are procedures in place where 
accrediting agencies and states and students are all notified about institutions that lose eligibility. So that happens separate from the 9010 issue. It's actually triggered by the loss of, of institutional eligibility. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see like a maybe after the first year um, <clears throat> requiring that they let students know that, you know, they're in danger at least of losing funds so they can plan ahead. Thank you. We'll take we'll take that back. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, with that, Greg, um, is the department ready for a temperature check on the entirety of issue paper seven on the 9010 rule? I think so. All right. So ending the ending our Friday the right way, with the temperature check. Everyone could just hold their thumbs, middle of their screen, nice and uh, nice and clearly. All right. Seeing one thumb down, um, Brad, more than welcome to come off of mute if you want to add anything else to the department's consideration into uh, uh, week two. GIF. Good job. GIF. All right. Thank you guys so much for all your hard work today. Um, with that, Greg, I know that we're about 20 minutes out from public comment, so if folks have a sign in link for that, I would welcome them to sign on a little bit early just so we can get set up for for that period of uh, of our afternoon. But Greg, is there anything that the department would like to uh, close out week one with? Uh, yes, I think I'll read some of my personal poetry to all of you. No, I will not do that. Um, but I would uh, I would just want to say to everybody that uh, it's been a pleasure working with you this week. Um, I, I'm really impressed with the level of professionalism uh, and, and the knowledge uh, evidenced by everybody on this uh, on this panel. It's uh, it, it's been my my privilege to uh, to serve as the federal negotiator, and I look forward to working with all of you in the upcoming uh, two weeks. I do look forward to taking a break from it for a couple of days, but uh, over the weekend. But certainly look forward to coming back and uh, working with all of you as we as we move forward to try to get the best uh, right uh, the best package we can for for students and for institutions and for the uh, for the taxpayer. Um, that's about all I have to say. Uh, I don't know, and I'll turn it back over to the facilitators to determine uh, what we do between now and uh, four o'clock. Well, I do see, I will turn it over to Cindy momentarily, but I do want to just note that Johnson, you've got your hand up, please. Um, well, yeah, I want to uh, thank everyone on the, the panel for uh, this robust discussion the last week. Um, it's a lot more exhausting than I thought it would be, um, just in terms of brain power and uh, Sustaining it. But I do have a sub substantive question here. It, it's come up a few times in looking at the proposed regulations. Um, the issue of transcript withholding, which is something that's you know really central to the work I do. Um, people may not be familiar with this, but if you if you owe an institution money because your federal aid uh, didn't come through, or often because people drop out of school due to life events that happen. Um, you incur a tuition debt, and that really stops your uh, education from going forward. Uh, you're, you, you basically can't go anywhere because you can't get your transcript and you can't take out new loans. And uh, we've been uh, studying this in New York, uh, and data shows that nine out of 10 people who this impacts are uh, people of color. And that doesn't make, that makes complete sense when you just think of assets. These debts are often pretty low, uh, but people uh, of color just don't have uh, have acquired due to institutional race and they haven't acquired uh, the funds uh, or assets to pay off something for a rainy day like a $2,000 debt. And that that basically ends their educational trajectory at a young age. Um, they can file for bankruptcy, but that's really the only way, legal way to deal with the debt other than paying the entire thing off, which is often unaccountable. So I'm just wondering whether the uh, Department of Education would entertain uh, adding something to this negotiated rulemaking. Um, the, the Secretary Cardone has already talked about this and uh, how he thinks it's a racial justice issue, um, but it's left up largely to states and it seems like it could be a, a condition related to Title IV funding um, and that is within the purview of, uh, of the negotiated rulemaking that's going on right now. I, I would say that anything we would add would have to be under the, uh, you know, issues that we've discussed um, so far. We're, we're not adding additional um, issues to the table, but it but it could fit into what we're doing. I'm not precluding that. Um, 
there are, as it was well aware, uh, I, I believe that is correct. There are equity issues involved. Um, there are potentially some legal issues as to department's authority there. We have thought about it and we are very concerned about the fact that uh, there are students who don't get transcripts and their continu the continuing of, of their education is, is limited um, by that. Um, I don't want to make any uh, um, promises on the part of the department uh, for that uh, and to say any more than that we do feel it's a problem. However, if you want to uh, suggest that to us, um, feel free to do that. I, I will take it back. I will discuss with senior leadership and we will see, uh, uh, you know, what we might be able to do there. But again, not making any promises uh, one way or the other, but we will entertain it. All right, Dan. I just um, certainly echo Johnson's concerns about um, sort of the stranded credits, but really want to underscore that this is right now, it varies dramatically based on state. So in Virginia, for example, there's been some legislation that's um, being introduced in the current session around stranded credits because as a Virginia higher education institution, we're actually a state agency treated just as though we were the Department of Motor Vehicles, for example. And so we're subject to all of the laws of the state, including um, some fairly strict regulations around um, the bad debts that are owed to state agencies. So I think that would be one thing I would put out there is we want to be very mindful of differences across various states. And I know that this has come up as a federal issue as well. Thank you. I am. Um, I want to echo uh, Johnson's comment and say as well that I do think that there is room for this in the context of the issues on the table, particularly potentially in the context of program participation agreements. So. Um, hopefully we can do something meaningful for, for students there because this is a major issue that our offices see constantly. Thank you. Uh, Jamie. Um, I agree that this is a critical issue and it would be um, wonderful if the department could uh, think of some uh, creative and bold solutions. Um, I speak on this um, more as a person who has as an Ed employee and independently worked with Beyond 12 and NASFA when they counseled students from a uh, large institution that closed. Um, given the state of technology, uh, it might be possible at the point of closure to do things like universal transcript distribution by a closed in closing institution. And just let, let's just leap ahead. Um, I will share with you the WASC guidelines for what an institution uh, should do a teach out in terms of availability of transcripts, um, but this may be a moment that we can uh, go beyond. OK, thank you very much. And uh, Barmack. Yeah, I, I also share the sentiments that have been expressed around this. There are a couple of creative things this committee could do under its existing jurisdiction on, on the basis of the agenda at hand. Certainly, and, and I believe it was suggested earlier with regard to institutions that are either at risk of closure on provisional certification or otherwise subject to some uh, authority of the department uh, to, to preclude those institutions from having holds on transcripts and to mandate that they make arrangements while they're still alive with a state agency to to serve as a repository for transcripts. In addition, I want to suggest, when was it? Like six, seven years ago, public institutions that I won't name ended up disenrolling 30% of its students because it had allowed multiple years of enrollment with debts just, you know, with unpaid bills. So I would say that that no institution should be allowed to withhold, even for purposes of collection of debts any more than the last term of attendance, transcript for the last term of attendance. If you allowed the student to, to enroll again and again without having paid their bills, that's on you. That's a form of financial irresponsibility, and you certainly shouldn't be able to withhold the transcript. You know, I don't know of any, any other arrangement where the, total, the student already paid for everything else just because one term's uh, uh, tuition may, may may have a balance on the student account should not allow the institution to basically take the entirety of the transcript hostage. So 
we could we could always sort of come up with a creative solution around that, in, in, even with institutions that don't have any other adverse conditions. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, not seeing any other hands, I am more than happy to turn it over to uh, the FMCS lead facilitator, Cindy, who I know has a few remarks that should carry us to uh, public comment. So, Cindy, please. Thank you. I, oh, I'm not so sure I can talk for nine minutes, but I'll, I'll say what I have to say. Um, we too uh, from FMCS want to thank and commend each and every one of you for your hard work this week and the dedication that you are exhibiting um, to this process. Um, we also greatly appreciate all the kind feedback that we've received from a number of you um, uh, directly to FMCS and, and locally to the department. So that is greatly appreciated. Just a, a few housekeeping items as we prepare for this break between sessions. Um, a number of you have stated that you will submit text on various issues that have been discussed um, for the department to consider them between sessions um, so that they can really give it the time and, and uh, effort to you know, consider that and draft any amended text. And in the case of GE, the initial text, um, their goal, the department's goal, is to send out um, the amended text a week before the sessions, okay? So that you have the ability to, to look them over, okay? That being said, they need to have your proposals to them um, before that, so you know they, they it takes them time to prepare the text as it does you to write your proposals to them. So we ask that you send that text to them as soon as you have it, so it gives them ample time to give it the due consideration it deserves. Okay. Um, Just a reminder, as we progress into the second week and move closer to uh, the actual consensus uh, pro uh, taking process, um, just a reminder on consensus, okay? This is an issue by issue consensus process. So there will not be packaging for consensus and there will not be a, a, a consensus taken on the overall rule as a whole. We will stick to the um, um, issue by issue. Um, the sense um, on the consensus process per protocol should be based on serious reservations. And if you have those serious reservations and you are a thumbs down, just know that you will be asked to state what changes you would need to get you to one of the two consensus levels, either here or here. Okay. I that is all that I have to say. Um, oh, in addition, I forgot. I did forget to remind you that your proposals, your proposed text that you have, or any uh, information requests, please send them directly to me, and I will forward them on behalf of you to the department. If you want anything also disseminated to the committee um, as a whole, if you don't send it yourself and you're expecting me to send your, your proposals and things, you need to tell me that you want me to do that, okay? We encourage you to work together um, during this week if you uh, are so inclined uh, to um, meet and discuss and, and see, you know, um, sometimes a lot of times collaboration is uh, a pathway to agreement. So we do encourage you to do that. If FMCS can be of assistance to you in any manner, uh, anytime during this process, including the time between breaks, please feel free to reach out to us. And we still have five minutes. Does anybody need to stretch their legs for just a couple minutes? Or we do have two people in the waiting room. Um, at some point, we may have legs anyway, waiting for people to sign in. Again, I'm going to ask 
the public commenters that have time slots to please sign in um, so that we can make the best use of the time. Feel free to go ahead and sign in even if you have a later time slot. I can just provide a few a few clarifying notes for the public commenters. So when you do um, log in, I know we've been asking, but if you are listening to the live stream, it does create a bit of an echo if you still have it open once you're in the Zoom meeting. So if you wouldn't mind pausing that before um, admittance and um, just FMCS, you'll, you'll have three minutes to speak and FMCS will give you just an audible um, warning when you have 30 seconds left. And the idea there is not to, to interrupt the flow of your comment. It's just to let you know that we um, do try to, to fill the time as, as robustly as possible. So that's the only reason we do that. Um, and I'm seeing Brad's comments. If the department has an answer to the, the data request or the turnaround time, feel free to provide it. But, but I'm, I'm personally uh, not able to answer that, Brad, regarding response to data requests. Thank you. The request is if we could get them as they're available and not wait until the very end. I will check that. I'll check on that. Okay. Um, preference committee, do you want three minutes to stretch? Recognizing we don't want you to leave, or do you want to jump right in with uh, starting with the two people that have signed in already? Move on. I think we could go with the people who signed in. Yep. All right, uh, Brady. I'm Brady and Kevin. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Kevin, who are we admitting first? We're going to be admitting uh, Gabriel Flores, representing Title Three Access to Core ELL Instructional Coach, in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Mouthful. Let in. Mr. Flores, good afternoon. Can you hear us, Mr. Flores? Yes, I could. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You have three minutes for public comment um, beginning when you start speaking. All right. Thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. And thanks especially to all of you for your public service. Uh, this is hard work, and I'm grateful and thankful for your efforts. My hope is that the uh, Biden administration and the Education Department, along with the U.S. Congress, will find a way to bring appropriate levels of accountability to all schools, not simply the private and for-profit colleges and universities. Now, here's why I feel this way. I live in Los Angeles, California. I have worked for the Los Angeles Unified School District for more than 23 years. I completed my undergraduate teaching credential and master's degree at Cal State University, Northridge. I earned a graduate certificate from Walden University, a school administration credential at National University, and I completed my doctoral program at University of Phoenix. My dissertation investigated teacher attitudes toward a more balanced multicultural education through the implementation of LGBT themed children's literature in classrooms. I am a published researcher, university faculty member, presenter at national conferences, and a transformational leader within my school district. I am asking that this rulemaking committee and its members please take great care with the way it speaks of certain schools and programs. The quality of the education I received at all of my alma maters, public, private, for-profit, non-profit, is noteworthy. I hope you'll reinforce that. I do not subscribe to the notion that a non-profit institution is somehow automatically providing a higher quality education. Not at all. I received an exemplary education at my for-profit schools that I attended. The coursework was meaningful, rigorous, relevant, and immediately applicable to my profession. I believe that the aspiring college students need to find programs that match wherever they are at in life. That's what I have done. I find it disturbing when regulators exhibit a bias toward one school over another. When you speak of for-profits, please be sure to acknowledge accreditation. This debate should not focus solely on money or how much a graduate earns. I work in public education at LAUSD. I'm grateful for what I earn in my occupation, but to evaluate the quality of all of my training based solely on my earned wages, well, that would be a mistake. 
take great care, please, as you write gainful employment standards and other rules. Understand that my wage is based on my chosen profession and where I live. Let us not create a new form of discrimination toward alumni who are creating positive social change and contributing to their society, just because you may not believe that they should have attended a different college or university. Do not speak ill of my hard work and determination because you may not agree where I completed my degree program. Even no university 30 seconds to go. A traditional student, working adult, but the University of Phoenix. When I attended, staff worked very hard to ensure I succeeded and completed my program. Please take great care to recognize our hardworking Americans who keep aspiring toward higher education and new learning. That's what we need not a system that prioritizes one school type over another. Stop discriminating and undermining people's education, my education. Create a more meaningful, positive educational change for all America. I know that's what you're working to do, but please keep in mind that all of us who have already graduated are applying what we have learned in the workplace. I know the committee has good intentions. This is important work. The policy making process is our time is up. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Flores. Thank you. All right, uh, Kevin, who are we uh, hearing from next? Let's see here. Uh, we have uh, we have Dr. Mary Ann Markey uh, representing themselves. Good afternoon, Dr. Markey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, we can hear you. Video is great as well. Um, you have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. Very, very good. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mary Ann Markey, and I've been teaching for Grand Canyon University since 2010, along with several other nonprofit and for profit institutions. While facilitating the majority of my classes online, I've noticed that some school administrations engage in practices that hinder students. For example, Grand Canyon requires professors to work 60 to 70 hours a week and reside in the Phoenix, Arizona area to obtain full-time status, resulting in approximately 92% of faculty being classified as part-time employees. I, like others in my position, need to work at other universities to make ends meet on a part-time salary, which can impact the quality of instruction that students receive. Although I'm classified as part-time, this semester I have been teaching four courses, which requires reviewing over 700 student discussion board posts and often multiple writing assignments taking more than 40 hours of work each week. I want to give my students more individualized instruction, but the current system makes that impossible. If these schools invested more in their professors than in advisors and recruiters, it would lead to better outcomes for the students. As a professor, I'm trying to help all my students reach their professional goals, but Grand Canyon has told me that it's not a professor's job to advise students about any risks associated with pursuing a graduate level education. As a result, many students pursue expensive degrees that fail to provide a decent return on their investment. I teach capstone courses, which are the final courses required in a student's undergraduate degree plan. I ask my students to do a cost benefit analysis to consider whether a master's or a PhD is necessary, but many of my students have already been convinced that they must have a more advanced or terminal degree. They're often shocked to learn the reality of the job market they're about to enter in which an advanced degree may not benefit them and only result in greater debt. If the university's goal is to attract and retain students at any cost, that's unethical. I want them to attend because they'll uh, Mark, you have 30 seconds remaining. Very good. I want them to attend because they'll receive a quality education. I don't want my students to walk away with excessive debt and an inability to function within their chosen career. Unfortunately, the growth of online schools sometimes puts us at a disadvantage 
by limiting access for students to build quality relationships with professors who truly care about their future. Someone needs to ensure that schools are investing in more long-term instructional teams and offering quality Thank programs. Marky, your time is, is done. Thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for your comment. Um, Kevin, who are we admitting next? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that, I was muted. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Charles Riser Jr. Uh, representing, he's a cow, uh, let's say, cow, uh, co founder of the Temple, a Paul Mitchell partner school, and uh, the Temple from Annapolis, Maryland. Mr. Riser, can you hear me? Here he comes. I see you, Mr. Riser. You just got to turn on your audio. Um, Kevin, do you want to admit the next speaker while we while we work on? Sure. Let's see. Let's do. Uh, we have uh, Harris Lieutenant uh, representing the Studio Academy of Beauty. Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind just messaging Mr. Riser just to see if he's having audio troubles. Uh, Miss Lieutenant, can you hear me? Looks like we are still having a few audio hiccups with our speakers. Um, Kevin, why don't you admit uh, uh, one more, and I and I can also send send them a message. Sure, they, they got to connect. Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, next person will be uh, Aaron Schenk, uh, Executive Director of MAACS. The third time. Mr. Schenk, good afternoon. Can you hear us? Yes. Excellent. Would you, would you mind pausing your, your live stream in the background? We're just getting a bit of a, an echo. Our uh, uh, next person will be uh, Aaron Schenk, uh, Executive Director of MAACS. Aaron, would you mind? So I think you have the live stream on in the background. Would you mind turning it off because oh, we're getting well, some feedback? Yeah. I'll tell you what, can you come back to me as I, as I do that? Uh, sure. Uh, let me mute you real quick. Um, Paris, are you? I think I have your audio is connected. Are you able to uh, uh, hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Um, if you're comfortable, feel free to turn on your video. Otherwise, you have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. Oh, there you go. You just got to come off of mute and you're good to go. Okay. okay. Am I okay? Hi, my name is Paris Lieutenant. I'm an esthetician graduate from the Studio Academy of Beauty in Canada, Arizona. I know a lot of you on here may think that for-profit schools are bad, but I really enjoyed my experience from beginning to the end. They were very helpful with not only my schooling, but helping me get a successful job in the industry. So when I heard about this meeting, they let me know about it and told me that if I enjoyed my experience, I should come on here and make a statement because it, they weren't only helpful with making me I'm sorry, I'm uh, they weren't only helpful with getting me through my schooling but getting me into a successful job in the industry and i just wanted people to have the same the same chance that i did to enjoy their schooling as well thank you thank you for your public comment uh, readmit Aaron, see if we got everything squared away. Sounds good. All right, Mr. Shank, welcome back. Thank you. Can you hear me? Everything good? You can, yeah, sounds great. Um, you have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. 
Right, well, thank you very much. My name is Aaron Shank. I'm the director of the Mid-Atlantic Association of Career Schools, which represents about 100 technical colleges and career schools in several states. Our institutions offer diverse programs. Some examples are welding, construction, auto mechanics, aviation maintenance, uh, you know, culinary arts, IT, cosmetology, nursing, and many, many more. Um, our graduates literally build your homes, keep your electricity on, fix your cars, keep your planes in the air, cut your hair, and many other essential jobs. Um, many of our students are ones that you know prefer not to attend a liberal arts, or maybe they prefer you know a shorter term program. They want to get out in the workforce quicker, or they just want a hands-on uh, career. Our membership includes both for-profit and non-profit schools. However, a vast number of post-secondary uh, career and technical schools are considered for-profit under their tax status. Sometimes uh, certain groups or media uh, looks at for-profit and they look at them all as kind of the same apples on 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 a tree. Um, nothing further could be true. I have personally visited over 100 campuses of Title IV eligible for-profit schools. What I've seen with my own eyes uh, does not reflect the perception somehow. The diversity of the sector, the high level of education and student outcomes, the employer satisfaction, and so many other positives of the sector have blown me away on my visits. That said, I do not question the previous testifiers who shared a negative experience as their personal story, and I trust uh, they are accurate. Nor do I question that some schools have let some students down particularly those who have closed their doors early. However, these cases are not the norm and do not reflect the majority. We need the day to try and help tell our story. I have two minutes to left to do that. Plus, I would like to make a unique offer to any member of this committee. Um, my board of directors meets next week, January 26th. This board made up of leaders of both uh, many for-profits and non-profits, and they represent a diverse field of trade. We offer uh, any, any committee member wanted time to meet with our board. We'd be happy to share any information on our sector. We'd be happy to hear any criticisms you have um, or any questions you may have on specific issues. If you're not available that date, we we'll welcome to be a separate different uh, The schools represented by my board many years, including one of them recently and, uh, uh, by Forbes magazine as the number one trade school in the country. They take their students, employers, and communities very seriously um, and would love to have a conversation with any member of this committee. If any of you are interested in picking us up in this offer, uh, my email address is Aaron A A R O N at M A A C S dot U S. Again, that's Aaron A A R O N at M A A C S dot U S. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Shank, for your comment. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Is Mr. Riser ready to go? He's already in. I believe so. You just got to come off of mute. I'm off of mute. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, we can hear you great. Perfect. You have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Reiser. 20 years ago, I co-founded two career colleges with my wife, Sharon. Our schools enroll approximately 150 students a year. And since founding, we have graduated close to 2000 students. My mom has been a hairdresser all of my life. The versatility of her career choice allowed my family to have the additional money to supplement my father's income of giving my mom the freedom to stay home and raise my siblings and myself. After studying computer science in college, I made a career change with my parents' approval and became a hairdresser myself. I have seen firsthand how solid training in a hands-on vocational career can be as rewarding as a degree from a traditional four or five year institution. College enrollments across the United States continue to drop as students look for less costly alternatives that will allow them to enter the workplace faster with less debt than they would get from a traditional institution. Personally, I support the idea that the investment of taxpayers dollars into a student's education needs to see a solid return on investment. I am suggesting that we focus on the fact that a student's income directly out of school is much different from their earnings potential later on in their in their careers. The cosmetology industry, much like many other industries, requires time and experience to gain a higher income. One of the reasons we have income based repayment programs is to allow graduates to increase their debt payments slowly to match the income levels as they grow in their careers. The government already acknowledges that people make less income initially as they grow and come out of college. Additionally, it would be helpful if we were able to establish GE metrics that account for unreported income as the variance in our industry disproportionately impacts the numbers for our graduates income. The IRS has shown 
that the average of 10% of tips in the cosmetology industry go unrecognized. And while our schools recognize this should not happen and we do our part by adjusting our curriculum to educate our students on their financial responsibilities, the reality is that our income in the industry is unreported. Finally, some have suggested that community colleges can fill the needs for career and certificate-based education like our schools offer. However, during the last round of gainful employment, most of our local community colleges reached out to our campus locations because they were exploring removing their certificate-based programs precisely because they didn't feel they would be able to comply with gainful employment regulations. This only harms student access to vocational programs by reducing the amount of programs available to our students. I wanted to thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today, and I sincerely look forward to the outcome of these negotiations. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, Kevin, I think we are ready for our next speaker. We have Jenna Batoko representing themselves. Good afternoon, Jenna. Are you able to enable your audio? Good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Dowd, are you able to hear us? Yes. All right, you have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cheryl Dowd. I'm the Senior Director for the WCET State Authorization Network. We're a membership organization of more than 800 institutions nationwide desiring to provide student protections through meeting state and federal compliance requirements for out-of-state activities of the institutions. We appreciate the department giving me the opportunity to speak today uh, regarding proposed language for 668.14b32, which addresses institutions programs that lead to professional licensure or certification. We completely agree with the need to develop processes to support students to make informed decisions regarding programs leading professional licensure or certification. However, we wish to raise a few concerns about the proposed language in our interest in the development of regulations for which institutions can clearly comply to protect students. We believe the proposed language is directing that in each state for which institutions have state approval, um, complying with 600.9, noting that 600.9c does include distance education, that the institutions must ensure that the programmatic accreditation is obtained if required and ensure that the program satisfies educational requirements in the state. So I have four um, points to that effect. First, starting with the term ensure. What does, what does the compliance look like? What are the parameters to um, the term ensure? Second point, to require that the institution curriculum must meet state educational prerequisites, I urge the consideration that there be input to this committee from state licensing boards to address how state licensing boards can collaborate with institutions to support research so that the institutions can find, review, and assess whether the institution's curriculum meets state educational requirements. As we know, requirements vary per state. So when we consider these requirements, the develop of a curriculum to meet educational requirements for all states where the institutions meet state institutional approval per 600.9 may be impossible. Examples in include perhaps teacher education for which states may require a state history or state culture course pertaining to the state. Or for example, experiential learning requirements, which vary state by state. How should the institution address that curriculum piece um, for the number of hours and perhaps classifications? And the fourth point, uh, per the discussion uh, this morning amongst the regulators, uh, excuse me, a bunch the, uh, regarding the negotiators about institutions not offering programs where the curriculum does not meet educational requirements, we're wondering if there may be a need for consideration for um, exceptions for certain groups of people who may wish to pursue programs in a particular state but had no interest in remaining in that state to obtain a license. Such groups could consider you may want to consider our military students and their dependents who are located in a particular state while participating in a program of 30 seconds but but intend to pursue a license in another state. Another example could be students desiring the training from a specific institution but desiring to seek a license in a state where there are workforce needs. I thank you very much for considering these concerns raised as you develop a working regulation for which institutions can comply to protect students. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Dowd, for your comment. All right, Kevin, I think we are ready for our next speaker. All right, we have Victor in Zunza representing Swords 
to plowshares. Mr. Nzunza, can you hear us? Good afternoon, Mr. Nzunza. Can you hear us? Yes. Great. Good afternoon. You have three minutes for public comment uh, beginning whenever you start speaking. Thank you. So what follows is simply the statement from Sword Supply Shares on the 9010 loophole. So good afternoon to the officials and staff of the Department of Education. My name is Victor Nzunza. I'm a Marine Corps veteran and I serve as a policy analyst at Sword Supply Shares. Our agency was established in 1974 to heal the wounds of war, restore dignity, hope, and self-sufficiency to all veterans in need, and prevent and end homelessness and poverty among veterans. We offer employment and job training, supportive housing programs, permanent housing placement, counseling and case management, and legal services. One of the most significant life-changing opportunities for veterans is their time in college made possible by the benefits earned during their time in service. The policy department at Source Supply Shares has spent over five years researching and advocating on behalf of military connected students. We have developed partnerships with students and leaders across the country to determine why institutional support systems matter. Institutions must have integrity and they must make a commitment to support the students who come through their doors to provide quality education in a reputable, Degree. Our work with military connected students has revealed inconsistencies in support systems, leading many to seek outside resources in their communities. For example, in many of our recent studies, we found that students often struggle with financial issues, causing housing instability and food insecurity. The reality is that our, our military communities already face multiple challenges in their efforts to assimilate back into society. Predatory colleges exacerbate this unfortunate situation and can derail their futures entirely. Our agency administers VA Supportive Services for Veterans and Families, or SSVF, funds that help veterans on the verge of financial disaster and homelessness. Student veterans come to us for help. Meanwhile, the 9010 loophole allows predatory colleges to rob veteran students of their educational benefits and deny them the promise of future careers which require a college degree. Today, we ask the Department of Education to ensure strong implementation of the new law to close the 9010 loophole. As you know, the 9010 loophole resulted in the targeting- Victor, you have 30 seconds remaining. Okay, great. Thank you. By aggressive and deceptive colleges, countless service members, veterans, family members, and survivors were seen as nothing more than dollar signs in uniform and had their lives ruined because of this loophole. We thank bipartisan members of Congress for listening to us and finally closing the 9010 loophole. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Nzunza. Thank you. All right, Kevin, I think we're ready for our next speaker. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah. I already announced uh, Jenna, but it was actually Cheryl Dowd who did the speaking. So we were going to hear from the actual Jenna, uh, Jenna Patoko. Um, I'm letting this Patoko representing themselves. Good afternoon, Ms. Patoko. Can you hear us? Hi, yeah. Can you hear me? We can, yes. You have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. All right, thank you. Um, this is Jenna Patoko, and I've been a cosmetologist for, for 10 years. My education started at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was studying communications and PR. Um, I'm not a student who can learn from books and lectures, so I found myself really fighting to keep my head above the water in classes. And after admitting I was miserable in this traditional learning environment, I dropped out after completing my junior year of college. After doing my research, I enrolled into a Paul Mitchell cosmetology school. Uh, for the first time in my life, school was fun. I was, I loved learning and I was, uh, the training really connected with me. After getting my license, I started my career like 99% of the cosm cosmetologists do, which is as an apprentice making minimum wage. That was nine years ago. 
Uh, building my book took many years and required a lot of extra days at the salon to build as quickly as I could. I'm now on my own and extremely su successful and also have my own salon in New York City. Uh, doing what I love and what I'm su successful at meant sacrificing provided health care, paid time off, and paid maternity leave. This never made me question, do I actually want to do this? I recognized how majority of people fail to even find a passion in life, especially one that creates a salary. I knew it would take time and a lot of effort to make money and reach a salary that was realistic for affording a life that wasn't paycheck to paycheck. People who find a passion sacrifice the ease of success because they truly love what they do. I think it is unfair that the committee here is putting both patients and education of our trades into gainful employment metrics that are so out of touch with the reality of career growth, especially for this industry. That's all. Great, thank you. We appreciate your public comment. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And Kevin, who is our final uh, commenter for today and in fact this week? Last but not least, we have Juan Fernandez representing themselves. Good afternoon, Mr. Fernandez. Can you hear us? Looks like he needs to enable his audio. Oh, there we go. Can you hear us? Uh, absolutely. Great. You have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you start speaking. E excellent. Um, my name is Juan Fernandez, not John K, but that's OK. <laughs> that is really irrelevant. What's, what really matters is the three minutes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon and thank you all for your public service. The work you do is very important. Uh, service to our country has been uh, part of my family uh, makeup. Uh, my brother is a retired Air Force guy and I am a 30 year Army veteran. Uh, I use my GI Bill funds to work on a degree at the University of Phoenix. I started in 2004 uh, when I was assigned to Southern Command in Miami. Uh, managing work, family, and uh, and school was a challenge. And the UOP or University of Phoenix had a non-traditional long-distance program, which at that time solved many of the problems that I that employed uh, students face, uh, especially those in the armed services. I was able to find um, a flexible option later at the University of Phoenix to work on my doctorate degree. I did then rule policy argument to downgrade what I accomplished at the University of Phoenix. We veterans know how to choose a school based on what we need and we work hard to finish our coursework and earn our degrees and the instruction quality was obvious. In fact, the application of lessons from a leadership class that I took before departing to serve in Iraq was instrumental in the success of the core staff engineer section I led from 2006 and 2007, actually under the leadership of uh, General Odierno, uh, who passed um, recently. The university was accredited. Accredited schools should be held to the same rules uh, all. Um, and then the most important thing is, is that through it all, the support I received at the University of Phoenix made it possible for me to succeed in my postgraduate courses. Um, please, my request is that you engage more students with stories like mine. I know that there are some other students that will present you the counterpoint, but my point is that uh, the university was was um, was fun, was uh, engaging. Juan, you have 30 seconds. Um, we need consistency in the rules so that we can all uh, advance in our careers. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I yield the, the rest of my time. Thank you very much and thank you for your public comment. All right, so with that, I believe we are at time. Thank you to all of our public commenters and thank you to all the work that this committee uh, has accomplished this week. As always, if FMCS can be of service in between sessions, don't hesitate to reach out um, and we look forward to continued engagement with this committee. Thank you all very much.